The meeting is now reconvened to open session. The board would like to remind the public that this meeting is being audio and video recorded. It is available via live stream for the public through links found on the front page of the RUSD website. We would also remind everyone to please enter and exit through the lobby. Trustee Counter, would you please do us the honors of introducing the color guard this evening? Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the presentation of the colors by our Rockland Unified School District's junior ROTC color guard and the Pledge of Allegiance. The commander and U.S. flag bearer for this evening's color guard is Cadet Captain Ryan Manning. The state flag is carried by Cadet Captain Sophia Burkhalter. The right guard is Cadet Lieutenant Luke Colonel Liam Turley. The left guard is Cadet Staff Sergeant Titan Owens. And the alternate for tonight is Cadet Master Sergeant Ryan Southworth. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Now moving to our special recognition and presentations for the evening. Chief Desange, will you please introduce our family partners in education for the night? Good evening, President Setoff, trustees and superintendent stock. The family partners in education program allows the Rockland Unified School District to recognize family engagement and involvement to help our students achieve excellence during the school year. Springview Middle School Principal Danielle Lauer is introducing the Stevens family for tonight's Family Partners in Education Recognition. Good evening, Superintendent Stock and Board of Trustees. It is with great pleasure to introduce Jennifer Stevens, her daughter Riley, who's an incoming seventh grader next year, current eighth grader Jackson, and her husband Will. With great gratitude, I extend this sincere recognition to you, Jennifer, for your outstanding commitment and dedication as a volunteer at Springview Middle School. Your tireless efforts have significantly enriched, enriched our school community and positively impacted the lives of our students, staff, and fellow parents. Your willingness to give your time and expertise in support of our school's initiatives and activities has not gone unnoticed. Whether it was assisting with our new Watch Pogs program organizing events, being a leader on our PTC, creating our PTC website, or contributing to the fundraising efforts, your contributions have been invaluable and have helped enhance the overall educational experience for our students. Your passion for education and your support for our school's mission have, has served as an inspiration for all of us. Your positive attitude, reliability, and willingness to go above and beyond have made a lasting impression on everyone you have worked with including my office staff who knows you will always respond. <laughs> you have gone above and beyond supporting Springview all the while having a full-time job and being your family manager. On behalf of the entire Springview community, I would like to express our deepest appreciation for your service and dedication. Your commitment to making a difference in the lives of our students exemplifies the true spirit of volunteerism and we are truly grateful for everything you've done. We are very lucky that we get to continue our partnership with you the next two years. And um, I'm grateful to have you as an inter integral part of our school community. Thank you again for being a great volunteer. Your impact will be felt for years to come. That again is for you, so thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Stevens family. Thank you guys for, and thank you, principal. So thank you guys for, 
for letting her do all these great things, for the PTC, for the support, for the help. Again, I say it and, and I truly mean it. This is what makes Rockland a great community and a great place to raise kids and a great place for your family. So people like yourself, like your family, doing all the great work. Eighth grader, so rolling out, and then incoming seventh grader, so you got plenty more time. So we'll, <laughs> we'll thank you in advance. So we'll rotate through this. Um, come on up, guys, we're gonna get a picture. So we'll give that to your sister. So. <laughs> so she can manage it, but thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Chief Dessange, will you please share with us our employee recognition for the evening? President Sadoff, Trustees and Superintendent Stock, for tonight's employee recognition, Cobblestone Elementary School Principal Kathy Goddard will join us to introduce Patty Seafried. Good evening, President Sadoff, members of the board, and Superintendent Stock. It is an honor to be here, and I'm so pleased to share with you about a really amazing professional and to have her be recognized tonight. Um, I'm gonna try and get through this, um, and I'm gonna read to you what I gave to you so everybody can hear how amazing Patty is. Um, Patty Seafried's current job title at Cobblestone is speech therapist. Before that, she served as our primary grade teacher for the Communication Delays and Disorders Special Day class and then the upper grade teacher for the Communication Delays and Disorders class. So she was a classroom teacher as a speech therapist. They're a rare breed and was just spectacular. She has supported students, staff, and parents in these capacities by setting high expectations. Armed with incredible positivity, she helps students achieve more than anyone could imagine. While an accomplished professional, Patty continues to learn and grow to best meet her students' needs. This has included advancing her augmentative and alternative communication device skills. That's a lot of words that mean she helps kids use iPads to communicate, okay? So that's you know 21st century kinds of things. And developing her expertise in identifying articulation challenges in second language learners. So she has to research their first language and figure out if that's really an articulation issue that the child is having. She also has provided support to new professionals through mentoring several budding new speech therapists in her district. However, Patty's secret weapon is establishing solid relationships with colleagues and her students. Hearing students and parents, hearing students and parents report that kids love going to speech is a frequent occurrence. In fact, they're disappointed when they're dismissed. They don't want to leave speech therapy. Former students maintain their connections with Patty as she celebrates their achievements long after they leave her classroom or her speech therapy room. I do not doubt that she is the person that kids will say is the teacher who made an enormous difference to them in school. But for the past, and I have to revise this, I wrote 18, but I think it's 19, almost 20 years, Patty has been far more than an exemplary teacher and speech therapist. Eight years ago, I think it's eight, she provided key leadership in adopting the Positive Behavior and Intervention Support Model, PBIS, at Cobblestone. She was our lead from the very beginning. Her energy, advocacy, and strong team building skills helped launch a very powerful system of support for students across the campus. She has successfully written numerous applications to be recognized at the gold level for PBIS implementation and is an essential part of our tier two intervention team. She is so worthy and deserving of this recognition and I feel so happy to be able to bring her here tonight. But there is one thing I need to share that I'm quite upset about in terms of a decision that you've recently made. 
and it is related to Patty because not too long ago you approved her retirement. And it's going to be a huge loss to our school, or where I go, and our district, because um, Patty is that amazing. So, Patty, would you please come up here? Hi, Patty. Thank you so much for all that you do for our district. I know working in special education, I know how important what you do is for the students to be able to learn how to communicate and interact with their you know, community at school. And clearly, thank you for sharing her story with us, um, just everything that you do above and beyond and all the hats that you clearly wear so well. And yeah, we will be sad to lose you, but hopefully lots of positive things ahead. <laughs> Thank you to you and your families for joining us. And while you are more than welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting, it is fully appropriate if you want to slip out at this time before we resume business. Thank you again. And now moving on to item 6.1, I'd like to welcome CSEA President Bettina Hart to present the CSEA report for the evening. Good evening, President uh, Sathoff, um, members of the, sorry, I'm a little under the weather today, so I'm sorry for being here, um, and Superintendent Stock. Um, I have a very short and easy um, review of what's been going on lately. Um, last week, I met with our nutrition service workers. I went out to their sites and met with a few of our leads. I got to see how they set up the schools for the breakfast and lunches. It was really neat to be able to see what they are doing for our schools and get some ideas from them to help to try to be a little bit more successful um, and being more efficient. Um, Monday, I was here at Bad New Employee Orientation where I got to meet with a few of our new special education aides, very sweet ladies. They're gonna be at Springview and at um, Antelope Creek. So as a former aide, it was neat to have them come in and meet with them and kind of give an update of, you know, how things have changed from when I did it many years ago. Um, yesterday, I went to Whitney High School where I met with a special education aide. Um, his name is Michael, um, Mike Orth, and he has agreed to be part of our um, uh, negotiation team for upcoming with a meeting with HR and such. I think he is gonna be a great help to us. He has positive energy. Um, very looking forward to keeping the good relationships that we have with HR, and he has the knowledge of being an aide and also working in the negotiations before from when he was with his previous job. So I'm really excited about having him. Um, with next week, we have our spring break coming up, so we're gonna be pretty busy. Our custodial teams will be working the schools, getting them all nice and deep cleaned for when the kids come back. Um, our grounds are gonna be out there working on the school sites for the spring sports that's getting started right now. Uh, our maintenance guys will be out working on numerous jobs that they've had. So it's gonna be a good week while everyone gets to sit home and enjoy. Uh, we'll be there busy working to make sure when everyone comes back, we'll be good to go for the start of the spring and end of the year. So um, that's pretty much all I have. So again, I'm sorry, um, short and sweet, but I just wanted to be here and, and thank you guys for having me. You're welcome. Thank you, Bettina, and I hope you feel better. Thank you for sharing tonight. We'll now move to item 6.2.
our RTPA, Rockland Teachers Professional Association. I'd like to welcome Travis to the stand. To the stand? I'm not, not swearing under oath. I'm not testifying to anything tonight. That's a different personality. Um, good evening, everyone. It's good to see you guys. I feel like I literally haven't been in here in months. It's only been weeks, not quite the second S of months, but, um, but all for good cause. My kids are overly involved, as most of our kids are, and so getting out to see their things. I was at Granite Bay High School for a track meet about 45 minutes ago, and luckily my daughter ran fast enough I could get here in time this today, so that worked out. Um, so um, again, just glad to be back in the room. Um, I want a huge shout out to my colleagues that have been able to come and fill in um, when I haven't been able to, to come recently. Um, I'm going to kind of theme tonight since we're moving into first off spring break. Woohoo! Um, so just kind of on the high note of a uh, very well deserved, needed week off. I wish it was a little bit later because I don't want to be a Debbie Downer yet, but uh, we've got a long gap between spring break and Memorial Day weekend slash summer. So um, hang in there, everybody. That goes for all of you guys included. I know we all have that reality. Seasonal allergies are probably just adding to the fun right now, too. So. Um, but kind of want to theme things under the umbrella of collaboration. Because um, when we do come back from spring break, we've got a lot of big collaborative things planned, um, things that we've been working on, things that some of you guys are directly involved with, but all of you are, are indirectly involved with, um, or less directly involved with, I guess is maybe the better way. Um, so I just want to share some examples first and kind of walk, walk through our collaborative story recently. So I'm going to start with some shout outs. Um, I want to give a huge shout out to, to Bill. Mr. McDonald over there. Um, he has taken the, the fun opportunity of re-imaging um, elementary VAPA and music, and I say fun with loose air quotes because um, we had a great plan last year. We landed it and learned that there was changes, improvements, and opportunities that we wanted to explore. And, and Bill willingly, unwillingly, was voluntold, told, or volunteered, right? Probably all of the, um, but took the lead on that and has led a, a, a very diverse committee um, through a deep dive into kind of what options or opportunities we might have in front of us to keep evolving our expansion of elementary music, elementary VAPA, and then just kind of the umbrella of all the things Prop 28 monies, um, if we ever get all of them, might actually open up for us. Um, but but the, the, the piece I want to shout out is that Bill has been more than willing to um, entertain and explore options as well as sometimes spirited conversations. Um, so we had a great conversation in here last week, um, and, and Bill led, uh, led the entire committee through that, um, redirected when need, re needed redirecting, and the gist of my, my comments around that were that it all came back to the focus of collaboration. What are we all here for, right? We all have our opinions, we all have our thoughts, we all have our ideas, but at the end of the day, we're all here to work together for that common goal of expanding or doing more with the, what we do or what we, we don't have. Um, so a huge shout out to, to Bill in, in the elementary ed services side there, and as well as the secondary service. They're kind of more indirectly involved there, but definitely involved. Um, next example, I want to give uh, uh, major props to, um, to Mr. Flowers and Beth Davidson. I know she's not here, but she's probably at home watching because she has nothing more exciting to do this evening, but watch us talk about and give her accolades. But Marty and Beth reached out to me a few weeks ago about something that they knew had been a collaborative conversation, but still maybe wasn't gonna land the way that we were hoping to. And it was common assessment in secondary math. And Marty and Beth and I had some great conversations. We thought we had done some good work collaboratively on how to land it the best we could, knowing not everybody's excited about being told or kind of guided to do certain things a certain way. Um, and surprise, surprise, it didn't land exactly how we wanted it to. Uh, but Marty and Beth were quick to, to get myself and the, the RTPA members that had concerns um, together, and we had a great conversation on how to move forward, where there's compromise, where there's not compromise, how can we, um, how can we suit and fill the needs of the board when it comes to math data and, and interests that you guys have a need to fill for your roles, um, how ed services can, can do their job better and, and fill the roles, then most importantly, how can this actually help our students get better, how can we do it in a way that it's effective and valid for our students to participate, not just in a way that we, we did it to do it. So huge props to, to both Marty and Beth for being willing to have that conversation. And more importantly, be willing to change. We're literally mid-practice, and, and all the credit to them, they had a lot of evidence that said, hey, look, everybody that was part of this process, the majority agreed to go this route. 
Um, and they could have simply stood on that. And I think they would have been very uh, um, validated in doing that, but they were willing to look at where there's uh, opportunities for flexibility, where there's opportunities to just do it differently, better, or just learn from and move forward as, as any good educator would. Um, moving on, um, one of our uh, more recent ones, actually just this week, I had an opportunity to sit in a meeting with, uh, with both Ryan Johnson, our lead of technology, and Craig Rouse, our lead of facilities, um, on, on a problem that was a really simple fix, but just kind of got lost in the minutia of the way things are done sometimes. Um, Ryan and Craig were, were quick to, to have answers. They came prepared to the meeting. Um, they again entertained some spirited conversation and uh, some frustrations, um, did it both very professionally. Um, and within literal hours of that meeting, like literally the next day, solutions were not just planned, but were installed and are now in use in classrooms. And so that, that is huge to the level of collaboration that those two and their entire departments, because I know it wasn't them that, that made, the, they made the call, but then their, their people went out and did the work and helped support. And I got a chance to touch base with both of them today and just checking up on how are things going, hey, this is what we're thinking, and that that's gonna be an evolving process because it was a two classroom solution, but is likely going to be a district wide conversation as things um, need, that, that uh, needs arise. So, um, the gist of it, though, was that, that they, they had products ready to go, they had solutions, and then they had people that were ready to implement, and that was huge. And again, it comes right back to that collaborative idea. Um, Ryan's probably the guy at the district office that reminds me the most of how he got into this because he was a teacher not that long ago, and because he got frustrated as a teacher at how things weren't getting done at the levels above him. And I know that's a motivation for a lot of people in the administrative side of education, um, but I think Ryan really, that really resonates because he is one of our out of district employees, um, and meaning we brought him in from somewhere else. Um, and so he brings not only just the, the traditional classroom experience, but he's experienced it in a different way in a different district. And, and it gives us a little bit of levity in that like, these aren't Rockland only problems. These are just organizational problems. These are budget problems, right? These are all problems that everybody faces and, and he just brings that, um, that calmness at times as we need. So again, huge shout out to those guys. But again, that umbrella of collaboration is how all these examples are getting done. Um, the next one is, um, and I don't know if it was just because it's who he, well, I do. I know it's because it's who he is, um, but it's also just because he's probably one of the smartest guys in the room and, and most people don't give him enough credit for it. But, um, but Superintendent Stock recently showed up to our um, bargaining session. And he did that because he knew the conversation that day. And just for those of you that don't know, superintendents don't traditionally come. Um, not in our room, but they're typically not welcome and they probably don't wanna be there as much on those rooms. We would, we would love to have superintendent stock there. We know that's not a reality as, as much as probably um, we would want. But he came into the room um, because we were gonna be talking about budget. And budget is always a topic that people have interest in. Um, it's likely gonna be a topic that people have some push and give and take and some frustration and kind of all those elements of emotions involved. Um, with superintendent stock there, Tony, uh, you're the district negotiation lead, Mr. Limoges. Um, he led a great conversation along with Jennifer, our, our new C CBO. Okay, sorry if I got that wrong. Um, CBO, and I think this was her only second or third time coming to that meeting as well, so she's still cutting her teeth and trying to fill out the room, and we're trying not to scare her off too much yet. Um, and, uh, and then also, because she's sitting in here too, I want to give a shout out to Beth behind me, because um, Beth comes pretty much any time our business office come, Beth comes. And, and, and no disrespect to Barbara, she was an amazing employee and did great work, but Beth is just as much the brains and bronze behind that, that department as well. So I want to give a huge shout out there. She comes, um, she helps us understand things that the business world does that we don't understand in the educational side with reasoning, with data, with all the things that we need, not only to understand for ourselves, but to help our membership understand it, to help just the general understanding of how money works in a educational organization. Um, but the biggest takeaway from that meeting and from Superintendent Stock's presence is that he was there under the sole reason of budget's not great right now, but we're gonna work together to work through this problem. And I can't stress enough the work together piece there. We have for a long time, some of you guys have been on the board long enough or at least in the community long enough that you know, RTPA has had a lot of frustrations when it comes to budget in general. And especially when there's budget reductions because more often than not, we come to a board meeting 
and we hear about budget reductions, and then everybody kind of turns and nods, and we hear some public comment, and then action's taken, and that's about it. Um, and not that that process is going to change dramatically, because you guys have some limits to what you can and how you do things, um, but a big step and a big reach from Superintendent Stock was how can our labor partners in our case RTPA, how can we be involved in all the things before that board presentation and that action by the board is taken? How can we discuss things? How can we come to agreements? How can we come to disagreements, right? All the pieces of that collaborative process. Um, he was in the room to represent that function of this process. And I can't, I can't give enough um, accolades or appreciation to Superintendent Stock, or the board. I mean, just in general, everybody that was willing to, uh, to, to be a part of that decision and that process moving forward. Um, some areas that, that we know that uh, there's going to be things that that cuts need to be made in certain areas in RTPA or the district, we're not going to agree on those things. Um, but I think we're at a place because of that collaborative uh, and relational kind of movement we've made that we're going to find, well, we're going to have to, but we're going to find a consensus in an agree to disagree, worst case scenario, right? Where, where we do know that certain things have to be reduced or limited or cut back or whatever the terminology or the reality is going to be but we're at least at the table when the conversation and the decision, right? We can make our voice heard, even if it doesn't sway or change the decision or the reality of the decision. Um, so that goes a huge, a huge way. Um, not just with me and those that sit on our bargaining team in that room, but with our entire membership. I think it gives us the opportunity to also inform the community um, as, as a secondary role that we have is just making sure that the community understands kind of where everything is and why we may or may not be in support of certain cuts and things. Um, the biggest takeaway from that room outside of the collaboration, though, was that it was very black and white that cuts that need to be made are going to be away from people and away from classrooms. And so in the grand scheme of things, like, I don't know what else we could really ask for when it comes to budget reductions. Um, I mean, I would love to just say none, but I mean, obviously, that, that reality isn't always an option. Um, but looking at ways where we can tighten things and we can still do the job that we're doing with maybe just, you know, less options in the refrigerator, if you will, right? We're not going to starve, but we're just going to have less to choose from. And I think that that collaborative approach is a huge piece to that. The last piece kind of under that umbrella of collaboration is, um, and some of you guys know because you get, uh, you were lucky enough to participate, but coming up in early April, we have our our labor leaders coming back, or, um, uh, both Mary and Sid, that we've been working for or with for three years now. Um, uh, Superintendent Stock and I have had a lot of opportunity recently to work with them um, to get uh, solicit feedback from our labor um, partners that are directly involved in that process and then developing some, um, some agendas and, and tasks for those groups um, for those two days, April 10th and April 11th. Um, so some really cool things that we have going is probably the biggest ask from those, uh, those site level groups are, we got this, but how do we globalize this now? Like people are ready to expand. What does the future look like? And the future doesn't mean what does it look like for our team of three, but what does it look like for our campus of 25? What does it look like for our district of 1,000 employees or, or whatever our numbers are? So it's really exciting to see those changes in that collaboration and the hunger for people to want to do more. Because um, at the end of the day, right, whether we fight about it and then get there or we collaborate and get there, we probably land on the same decision 99% of the time. It's just a lot more enjoyable. It's a lot better. It's more palatable if we can do it in some sort of collaborative way. So that leads to kind of the other side of the collaboration coin, because our ability as a labor group is to collaborate with you guys. It's very limited. As you guys know, there are rules and regulations on how and when we can engage with you guys. Um, for example, we would love to have all of you at points involved in our labor conversations. We get two at a time, and it rotates, right? And there's a whole process there. Um, my concern, just to share with you guys, just from an optics or a public labor collaboration, is that I come up here regularly and try to share accolades and appreciation for that labor relationship. I know you as a board have invested not just dollars, but a lot of time and energy into the labor process and that labor relation. And then the optics sometimes that happen at this podium don't always resonate or reverberate that labor collaboration when it comes to our organization and the school board. So, for example, we had um, Ms. Thomas, one of our um, RTPA leaders, was up here at the February 7th board meeting. I was my daughter's birthday that night. I wasn't here. She opted to fill in. She was up here giving a report. She had topics that weren't necessarily favorable to everybody's opinion on the board. And it was very obvious that the board had no interest in what Emily was up here saying. 
to the point where she was pretty much told, thank you, your time is up, go sit down. And whether that was the intent or not, that's what the community saw. So if I stand up here and share about labor collaboration, and the community sees it on our campuses, and the community feels it in our classrooms, but then they see that interaction at a board meeting, what does that say? Are we just kind of putting on this facade, or are we really collaborating? So just something for all of us to think about and how we can work to address that. Secondly, things happen, right? Everybody has their days, stuff gets misinterpreted, it happens, we're all human beings. I let that one kind of go, right? I, if, to me, seeing that happen to a leader of mine, somebody that is up here being vulnerable and putting themselves in my space um, at a request of me so I could spend some time with my family, it was very frustrating. I decided to let it go. I knew I couldn't be at the next board meeting. I didn't want to address stuff from, from the past, you know, too far in the, in the future. But then at the, what was it, the March 6th board meeting, unfortunately, we didn't have anybody present from the RTPA thing and conflicts happened but I saw a similar interaction when it came to public comment. And then, then, then this comment that I'm, this reason I'm talking to you right now stuck in my head and it's still there, right? So we've got two different board meetings. We've got a employee organization, a labor leader in our organization, and we've got a member of our community that are pretty much told, shut up and sit down. And that wasn't the literal word, so please don't, don't take that as, but that was the message from somebody that looked from the outside in, because I went back and watched those board meetings, as I imagine a lot of our community and stakeholders do, and that was the optics that looked like. So again, we're up here talking about collaboration. We've invested a lot of money and time in collaboration, and that's the collaborative example that we've seen when it comes to our school board. And again, I'm only giving two. There are plenty of good examples. We could go both ways with this, but just as those two moments kind of stuck in my head, I wanted to make sure that I addressed it with you guys tonight to do what you will with, right? Address it, work through it. Again, we have some Labor Days coming up. We get board members there to be a great opportunity to dive deeper into some of those things, um, as well as just in other individual conversations. But I just want to kind of leave with that. Again, lots of great labor work, a couple hiccups along the way, but the, the gist of all this is we are still moving forward, right? You're still the board president. I'm still the RTPA president. You are still the board of Rockland. And we're going to move forward and find ways to learn from these things, just like those other examples, right? Math didn't land well. We figured out a way to learn through it. So how can we find compromise? How can we find a way to show the community as labor leaders, as school district leaders, that collaboration isn't just one-off things that happen, but it happens from the top down, from the outside in, from the bottom up? That's all I got. Thank you, Travis, for sharing. And uh, I appreciate many things that you shared tonight. Thank you for uh, the accolades, but more importantly, thank you for sharing how you feel and concerns that you have. And um, I would uh, be happy to sit down and talk, the two of us. Um, I know we've talked about that a few times. Um, I would like to see a date get on the calendar. Um, so thank you for sharing today. I did write down comments of what you shared, so thank you. At this time, uh, we will now move to item 7.1, uh, which typically would be our student board representative, um, but they were unable to make it this evening, so we have no report uh, for this evening. So we'll move on to 7.2, comments from board and superintendent. Trustees, do you have any comments that you'd like to share this evening? Just, I guess, one simple one. Um, just looking forward to the uh, unified games. I know it's always a fun event. So uh, Whitney High School tomorrow, for those of you that are listening in the crowd and there, Whitney High School, I think it's 6 o'clock. Help me out, Travis, 6, 630, something like that. Six, Sorry, thing. Six, Whitney High School, uh, great opportune time, a fun event. Um, again, just a lot of fun, a lot of excitement. So great event. Look forward. Um, yeah, I just wanted to share a couple things. Um, so I was able to attend the um, Springview Middle School Showcase Night and was very impressed by what all the teachers put on um, and just with um, Principal Lauer as well and her words to the families. I could tell that emotions are sometimes running high when it comes to starting um, a new um, step in education. And so she handled it beautifully and the teachers just really put on a great display of what students have to look forward to. And then the other thing is um, with WASC, which has been going on um, at Rockland High School. So I was able to attend on Sunday as well as today, um, this afternoon, 
to just hear about the collaboration that staff was able to work on there um, with the different department groups and as well as today hear from the WAS committee and what their report out was and it was very positive. Um, so I just wanted to just kind of give a shout out to Rockland High, the administrators and teachers and just all the hard work that was put into that self-study that they did and their commitment to continuing to grow and serve the students there uh, to the best of their abilities. I have just a couple things to share. Um, in the last few weeks, I was um, asked to be a judge at the Founding Forward 2024 Mock Article 5 convention where we had teams from Rockland and Whitney and other teams in the community. It was amazing. These youth are so impressive. I'll, I'll share a couple of the articles that they defended, um, included ranked choice voting, um, federal court term limits, voter integrity, Rockland High School uh, chose capital punishment, territory representation, national debt management, civic education, and Whitney High School did an age limit for our president, which um, all of it was quite entertaining. And then the other teams could ask uh, their questions and they had to defend and uh, it really was impressive. They were very articulate and did a really great job and Rockland High School uh, got third place that day. So that was great to be part of. Uh, I also uh, attended um, Rockland High School's career day this week. So grateful to Rachel Lund who runs that and also to so many community members that come and volunteer their time and spend um, time sharing the pros and cons of their professions. We had engineers and nurses and counselors and physical therapists and just a huge variety. It was really great to see so many community members uh, investing in our students. I also uh, attended the uh, K through third VAPA music work group meeting. And thank you to Dr. McDonald for all the work that he's done. I'm um, excited where we're headed, even with some Prop 28 restrictions, and we'll see, you know, the state has, has changed the rules for the game we're playing, and so it's quite frustrating, but uh, I have full confidence that we're going to get to somewhere we can, are happy with. Uh, we had, um, in addition, I just wanted to explain, WASC is an accreditation, and I also was at the meeting with Michelle on Sunday. It was interesting because the committee that was there is made up of teachers and principals from the area, or maybe the whole state, Roger, is that right, the area? Throughout the okay. Northern California area. Yes, and they were so impressed and asking so many good questions and taking notes and wanting to know how would this work for our schools, and so it was uh, really great to be uh, a part of that as well. And then um, I also, uh, Trustee Sutherland and I are on the student um, two-by-two -two committee, and always impressed with our ASB presidents and what they bring to the table. We had a really good conversation this meeting about mental health, and there are so many services that we offer at our high schools and how we can better get that information out to students. So it was really productive and I appreciate their, their time as well on that. Well, many things have been mentioned uh, that are great already. Um, I too want to echo the unified game. Uh, there are many families uh, that share with me each year their excitement to see their child uh, participate um, in something that's incredibly important to them. And I think it's always beautiful when our community comes out together uh, to celebrate and to be unified. I, I love the heart of that. I know there's many things that happen through the state uh, tomorrow to acknowledge developmental disabilities, to acknowledge Down syndrome awareness. Um, and I just think it's uh, beautiful the way that we host unified games to really bring our community together. Um, uh, also, if uh, you are bored on the weekends, it is so fun being out at rec programs uh, throughout our city to see our students. Um, I feel like every time I go out to our little league fields, I see a different student, a different age range, um, always excited. Are you here to watch my game? And then I feel bad going, oh no, how do I watch five games at one time, right? Um, but it's fun to see um, our students engaging in activities in our community outside of our campuses as well, in addition to on our campuses. Uh, and then additionally, I just uh, wanna thank, I know B Bettina mentioned it, um, and I believe uh, Travis mentioned it as well, but with spring break coming up, uh, there are many that are getting a much deserved break 
break, um, and I want you to enjoy that. Um, there are also many uh, that will still be here on our campuses, and so I just want to make sure that I echo uh, on behalf of the board uh, our appreciation. Uh, I know we uh, have some warm days right now, and then we have, uh, I think, one last rain coming, um, but just a uh, appreciation for the incredible work that is happening because we know we have a busy spring ahead of us. Um, so thank you in advance uh, for those that will still be working um, uh, although I think everybody are working in one way. I'm sure we're picking up projects at home, those that won't be on campuses. Superintendent Stock, do you have any comments? Just a, a couple of quick pieces. One is one acknowledge our, we had our uh, latest uh, parent education uh, series and it was uh, held this uh, Tuesday, I believe, and it was on uh, preparing students for college. And we had over 100, 150 people sign up for that, so great need. And we have an ongoing series this year, uh, and, and so you can find information on our website. Um, and, and we also want to uh, just echo the, the appreciation for all those who are getting a break and all those who are continuing to work. And beyond custodial grounds, our technology folks are out there working, and many of the folks in this building uh, keep making sure we get all the uh, applications processed, people paid on time, and all that other good stuff that, that comes out of here as well. And, and, and just again, um, looking forward to uh, the last nine week sprint uh, to this year and graduations and promotions are right around the corner. And, and we also um, look forward to uh, continuing to work together and we really do appreciate all of the different venue uh, avenues that were talked about in there and, and the board's really, uh, really direction that's been ongoing and that we work together to solve issues and, and appreciate that, that direction and that tangible work that you know, it has been outlined in the past and we know will continue over the next nine weeks and uh, months to come. Okay, thank you, Superintendent Stock. Okay, at this time we will move on to 8.1, our presentation by Dr. Justin Levitt from National Demographics Corporation regarding the transition to by trustee area elections. Um, and we also have uh, Attorney Michelle Cannon with us as well, thank you. Uh, good evening. Let me just see if I can pull this up here. And then start it right here, probably. Right. Perfect. Okay. Good evening. So um, I'm going to let um, Dr. Levitt introduce himself, and then I'll get started with what we're going to talk to you about tonight. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Justin Levitt. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. And he's with National Demographics Corporation, and he'll be your demographer walking you through the process for making a transition to by trustee area elections. So um, you'll remember that at your last board meeting, you adopted an intent resolution to make the transition to by trustee area elections. Um, after we're done with our presentation tonight, it will be your first public hearing on that topic. So we like to just provide an overview of what the legal requirements are, what the timeline is, and then Dr. Levitt will walk you through a lot of the demographics that you'll be looking at over the next few months as you walk through this process and work through this process. So in California, we have the California Voting Rights Act. It is similar but fairly significantly different from the Federal Voting Rights Act that a lot of you have probably heard of. It's been in the news a lot of the last few years. Um, California has its own. It's been on the books for about the last 20 years. And it requires that public agencies in California essentially protect the rights of minority voters to make sure that they're not unfairly impacted in various ways um, in um, elections for either board members, city council members, school district members, et cetera. And what it does is it prohibits at-large elections, and I'll give you a definition of that in a moment, that impair any of these things that we've got listed here, which is the ability for um, certain folks to elect candidates of choice to influence the outcome of an election, any elections that include racially polarized voting or vote dilution. And when we talk about racially polarized voting and vote dilution, the law is really focusing on minority populations, language minority populations, and whether they're being adversely impacted. One of the key things to keep in mind is that the California law does not require that there be any intent to actually discriminate or adversely impact any of these populations. So when districts and local agencies make the decision to make the change, it's not because they believe that they've unfairly impacted minorities or, or anything like that, and that's not in fact even required, um, but that you wanna make the transition to ensure that you're in legal compliance. 
um, when districts, cities, counties, hospital districts, et cetera, um, uh, elect um, members of their board at large, they are subject to being challenged under the CVRA. And the only safe harbor under the CVRA is to use trustee areas for election purposes. And so that's obviously what you're looking at doing here. So at-large elections, like you currently have, is when everyone who lives in your jurisdiction votes for every member of the school board during your elections. So we've got all populations across um, your city voting for each of you every time that you run for office. And that's considered at-large. By trustee area elections changes that so that wherever the trustee areas are, there will be trustee boundaries. Um, and we just have here trustee areas one through five, but it could be A through E or whatever else. Um, only the folks that live in those trustee areas will then vote for those trustees when it's election time. So it's a much smaller pool of people that would vote for each trustee and they will have to, and those will be the folks residing in that area. One of the things the law aimed to do would, was to make it easier for mo more folks to run for office. And so part of the thinking behind the law when it was enacted was that if you can run for office, and, and, and I think in large part they were thinking um, of larger jurisdictions as well, city of Los Angeles, county of Los Angeles, but if you could run for office and you only have to campaign and go door to door and send mailers in your you know, trustee area, that is an easier campaigning season than when you have to do it across an entire city or county or jurisdiction. And so that was one of the intents is we want to make it easier for more folks to run for office and to find a way to do it. And then there was also part of the law was that um, it made sense for people who live in certain areas, you know, maybe certain neighborhoods or towns within their jurisdiction or whatever the, the community might be, that it made sense for those people to vote for that candidate because maybe they knew them, they were part of the same community, they had shared interests and things like that, just to give you some of the background behind it. So as you look at making the transition to by trustee area elections, you will have five trustee areas, you currently have five trustees, only the folks that live in whatever those areas end up being will vote for those people. By the way, you know, some jurisdictions when they're doing this, they will also increase, you can increase or decrease board membership at the same time. That's a separate um, a process, but sometimes it's done at the same time concurrently. I just wanna mention it, because we have some other local jurisdictions in Northern California that have increased their board size at the same time, and I wanna make sure you understand it's different but there can be an overlay. That's not something that's going on here, but just in case anyone asks you about it. Okay, so CVRA challenges. You've probably seen this, it's been in the news a lot. Some districts don't wanna make the transition to um, by trustee areas. I work with a lot of school districts that say, we've got great minority um, representation on our board. In fact, the majority of our board is already minority. We don't feel like we have a problem. This doesn't make sense for us. We want everyone to vote for all of us. That's how we feel like we do the best business and have the best representation. Um, but the reason that they still go ahead and make the transition is because the cost of trying to fight a CVRA challenge is so incredibly expensive. Um, as I said, the law doesn't require any sort of intent um, to, to discriminate or, or violate the law. And no public entity, and this is still crazy me, to me today to actually say this, but no public entity in the state of California has ever prevailed on a challenge. None in any jurisdiction. So just the way that the law is written, it's really written to force public entities to go ahead and make this transition to buy trustee area elections. Um, and when uh, some of the public entities that we've got listed here have challenged it because they didn't feel like they needed to make the change. The attorney's fees and the expenses of the litigation, you've got experts because you're using demographers and then the attorney's fees is just prohibitively expensive. And so that's why when districts get a demand to make the change to buy trustee area elections or someone raises the issue, we more often than not see districts and boards going along with it just to avoid the unnecessary expense and litigation involved in trying to fight it. Okay, I'm gonna walk you quickly through the process to establish the by trustee area elections. So the first step is to adopt an intent resolution, which you all did at your last board meeting, which says we're going to make the transition to by trustee area elections. So you did that at March 6, on March 6th. Next is you have to hold two public hearings, uh, the first one you're doing tonight, and we call these pre-map hearings. No one's going to have looked at any maps, the demographer hasn't drawn any maps as far as what the trustee areas might look like. 
This is for the board to get information, for the public to get, uh, to get information, to hear from your demographer on what all of the requirements are that you, that you have to look like in putting together maps. So, and you're required to do two of these pre-map hearings. After tonight, you'll have one more at your next board meeting. Then you move to map consideration hearings where you will have draft maps. And when we say draft maps, we don't mean just a map of your jurisdiction, but it'll actually have draft trustee areas in it. And you'll get a few of those from your demographer to look at and consider. These are all done in public hearings because you, of course, want public participation. You'll get to ask the demographer questions. You'll get to talk about what you're all looking for on, on some of the um, elements that you're able to look at that, again, um, uh, Dr. Levitt will go through with you. And then, so after these four public hearings, the two pre-map and the, and the two map consideration hearings, you'll have a final public hearing where you will actually select the map that you want to use for, to establish trustee areas and also the sequencing schedule. And when we say sequencing schedule, we mean which trustee areas will be up for election in what year. We've got an election year this year, 2024. So two seats would be up in 2024, two seats would be up in 2026, and the board would establish the sequencing um, schedule for those as well. So those will be your public hearings. The final step is it goes to the Placer County Committee on School District Organization which is a countywide committee that has authority and jurisdiction over a lot of issues having to do with how school districts are organized, and it includes when there's changes to trustee area elections. They also have to hold at least one public hearing. They have to hold it within your jurisdiction. So although the county committee normally meets up uh, at Placer County Office of Ed in Auburn, they will actually hold the meeting in your jurisdiction, and they usually will hold it in your own board meeting so that it's convenient for you all and, and um, members of your community to attend that. They make a decision then to approve or deny the district's proposal to make this change. Once they do that, um, and I'm gonna assume that they're going to approve it, um, then it goes to the, then it's done. Um, you've completed your process and it will go to the county elections office to implement. Um, and the county elections office is required to get that, I think it's 125 days prior to the next election in order to implement it in time for the election. So that's sort of the, the steps that are included in it. I'm gonna just show this timeline and then um, Dr. Levitt will go through it in more detail. But you can see that we've got a tight timeline here, right? We've got meeting after meeting, we've got some special meetings, um, we've got deadlines for posting. Whenever we have draft maps, they have to be posted by law at least seven days in advance of a public hearing. So it's a very tight timeline for not only the demographer to put together maps, but if you get maps from community members, which some boards will, those also have to be in well, um, in advance so that they can be posted at least seven days in advance. So it might feel like you're going a little bit at breakneck speed to get all of this done um, in this time frame, um, but the re reason is um, there's a safe harbor under the CBRA. And so once you make a decision to make the transition, and again, you made that de uh, decision on March 6th, you only have 90 days to do all of this. So you guys are going to be under, under a time crunch. Other districts that are, are doing or have done the same thing have been under that same time crunch. We've only got 90 days to do it. So it, it'll feel like you're going really fast, but you can do it. We've mapped it out in a way that works with your schedule um, and, a, and maybe you know a special meeting or, uh, here or there to make sure that you can get it done in time. Okay, that's it for the process. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Levitt to walk you through the criteria, data, and tools that um, he'll be working with you uh, to help you with the process. Thank you um, for that introduction. And um, again, uh, my name is Dr. Justin Levitt with National Demographics Corporation. I'll mention my company this time. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here tonight to talk about the districting process. Um, I just wanna kind of go through, first of all, our criteria that we use for drawing trustee areas, and then provide a basic overview of the data and tools that we have available for um, residents. Our next meeting is a special meeting and at that time, we'll demo the tools for the community if, if anyone wants to watch or see. Um, the tools will be available with a, a number of helpful guides online as of tomorrow. But for now, we're just going to kind of do a brief overview of what's, what's available. Uh, so to start with our rules and goals, um, we divide our criteria into three parts. And I should mention, this recently changed. On January 1st, the legislature's Fair Maps Act of 2023 passed or into law. And because of that, the rules governing districting for school districts changed substantially. 
Before, I could do this all in one paragraph, and now I've got to have three separate columns to divide this up. Essentially, our left-hand column, our federal laws, these are things that apply to districts or trustee areas of every jurisdiction from Congress down to cities, you know, school districts, and other special districts. First and foremost is equal population. Trustee areas will have to have about the same number of residents. And this is based on the 2020 census. We use total population from the 2020 census for this number. We'll take our total population, divide it by five, and that'll be our target population for each of the five trustee areas. Um, and this is something that's dictated actually in both federal and state law, particularly how we have to do this. We don't have to get perfectly equal, but we have to get pretty close. Our maximum difference between the largest and smallest districts has to stay under 10%. And we'll look at some numbers on the next slide to go through that. Secondly, we have to follow the restraints of the Federal Voting Rights Act. While race and ethnicity cannot be the only factor or predominant factor in the creation of a trustee area, one of our analyses that we start doing tonight is looking at protect those protected class communities that we mentioned earlier in the California Voting Rights Act. Where do we see concentrations of minorities or language minorities, groups that have historically faced discrimination or barriers to registration and voting, to see whether or not there are communities within the district that need to be kept together. Um, in that way, we really get into what is at the heart of the districting process, which is this middle column. This is the new part that comes from the state law. We now have a priority ranking of five factors that we have to consider. And first and foremost is contiguity. That's a really hard way of saying that a district has to have one outside border. You can't have a little bit of the district on the east end of the district and another part on the west end and another part on the south end. You have to have a shape, a polygon, a regular shape um, that, come, that is your trustee area with one outside boundary. Secondly, we have to avoid division of neighborhoods and communities of interest. This is perhaps the broadest criterion. At the same time, this is where a lot of our discussion and debate will happen. Neighborhoods and communities of interest are areas that need to be kept together for the purposes of their fair and effective representation. We can think of homeowners associations, places with a similar development history or pattern, um, everything from a neighborhood that was developed by a single developer at a specific point in time to larger communities that maybe encompass several neighborhoods that have a shared need to stay together because they're in the same elementary attendance area, the same middle school attendance area, or for reasons like dealing with road crossings and students that have to cross the road in a particular way. And I really want to emphasize a lot of this is particular to the school district. So I want to think about this as something different than necessarily what a city might care about. The city of Rockland may have its own priorities or issues. We want to think about those concerns and issues relevant to the school district when we're talking about those neighborhoods and communities of interest. They may be things as well recognized as a particular subdivision. They may be things that nobody outside the school district would think about, like the division of monies or properties between different areas of the district. Um, third, division of census designated places and cities. This is a little bit of an odd one. This comes straight out of the county criteria language, um, but it applies to school districts as well. Any city, incorporated city, or census designated place has to be kept together, if at all possible, if the area is contiguous in and of itself. Uh, for our part, we do have small parts of cities other than Rockland in the district, a small portion of Placerville, for example. And any sorts of those areas are going to be something that we have to look at after communities of interest and neighborhoods. Um, the fourth, easily identifiable boundaries. This is the principle that it should be easy for voters to distinguish which district they live in. So to the extent we can follow major physical boundaries, whether they're roads, canals, um, other sorts of things that people use commonly to divide between areas, we need to strive to do so rather than jogging through neighborhoods. This is really aimed at sort of like if we have a 5%, if we, if we have to get to like a 5% deviation in a district, but it means following an important road like the freeway instead of jogging through a community, we need to do that. Um, and fifth, compactness. 
the law actually defines compactness specifically as not bypassing one group of people to get to a more distant group of people. And this is really aimed at those hooks and fingers, you know, those weird shapes that seem like they stretch along the edge of the district to pick up a particular house or neighborhood. Um, now, these are prioritized. They are rank ordered for a reason. So if, for example, we have a community of interest that isn't perfectly square or isn't perfectly round, we'd want to keep that community of interest together first before we worry about compactness. Essentially, what this criteria list is saying is that we need to justify the boundaries at the end of the day. And the lower the ranking, the higher up on this list, the better it is to be able to justify them. Finally, the law also includes a new prohibition against adopting districts for the purpose of favoring or discriminating against an incumbent, political candidate, or political party. So this basically expands on existing language in state law that really prevented us from or prevented any district from taking partisanship into account. Th this new law extended that to incumbency and political candidates as well. In addition to this list of criteria, other district factors, local factors like new growth or change in the community over time, can be taken into account as long as they don't prioritize over any of our state mandated criteria. So for example, if we know that there's new growth coming in a particular area of the district, then we can divide that up between two or more trustee areas, um, as long as that doesn't impede any of the other criteria on the list. And the reason is, is because no matter how much growth there is over the next decade, we have to use the 2020 census numbers as they are now. We can't make guesses about what population is going to come in the near, in, in over the next 10 years. Now, in 2030, we're going to have to look at the numbers again. Once we get the new census results, the first thing every district has to do is determine whether or not the numbers are even still population balanced, and then go through a, a hearing process for redistricting if necessary, or to confirm that the current districts still work. And we can walk through that later on um, as we get closer to the 2030, election, or 2030 redistricting. So looking at the 2020 numbers today, uh, the 2020 census counted 69,641 residents in the school district boundaries. Dividing by five, that means each trustee area will have approximately 13,925 residents. This means that each of the areas will likely fall somewhere in the neighborhood of you know, about 13,400 to about 14,300, give or take. We're essentially looking at a 1,392 person difference between the largest and smallest at most. Uh, we also looked at, we're also looking at the demographics of the different districts, and here we're at the top total population. Those are the total, those include everyone. Uh, we, the district as a whole is 64% non-Hispanic white, and then about 15% each Hispanic or Latino, or and 15% Native or uh, Asian Pacific Islander. Um, we also below that have our citizen voting age population. This is the population over the age of 18 with U.S. citizenship. This is what the courts actually use for voting rights because they call it the eligible voter count. Um, they recognize that in many cases there are big differences between citizen voting age and total population, um, in particular because of differences in citizenship rates and age of different uh, groups, particularly the Latino community. Um, overall, the district was 73% non-Hispanic white, so we do see that gap between total population and the population over the age of 18 with U.S. citizenship. And the Latino population is about 13%, and the Asian Pacific Islander population 11%. We also do a more thorough demographic analysis as part of our data that we have to collect in order to look at our neighborhoods, communities of interest, and other um, demographic concerns within the district. And so a lot of this comes from different data sources. Some of this comes from the American Community Survey. The American Community Survey is a program that replaced the old census long form that asks more detail about, from a section, eight, about 8% 8 of Americans a year get the American Community Survey. And it asks a lot more detail about everything from 
where you're employed and how long you've lived where you've lived to whether your house has electricity and where you get your electricity from. It's a very thorough survey and it provides a lot of demographic information um, on everything from housing and education to income and uh, whether or not people have children at home. And a lot of demographic data is available in that. We also use registration and turnout. This is from the statewide database, which is the state's repository of election and voting information that it collects from the counties every two years. Uh, again, this is a standard database that the state uses and the courts therefore use to look at registration and voting patterns. We have a lot of this mapped. Um, we're gonna look at two maps here, but I just wanna note that on our website, we'll have a link to an interactive web viewer where you can see a lot more of this demographic data um, for the different demographic fields. And if there is something there that you would like us to add or you'd like to see, please feel free to think about that, let us know. We can certainly add more information. There is a whole lot of data in, available in the American Community Survey that we'd love to show you. Um, the demographic maps we do have to show you tonight relate to the Voting Rights Act, and so we want to look to see whether or not there are any concentrations of the Latino uh, and Asian American communities. Um, in particular, if we look at these maps, the areas that are in the purples and blues are under 25% of that demographic group, and we're using the citizen voting age population here because that's what the courts would use to analyze it. Uh, we don't really see any concentrations of the Latino population within the district. Uh, if you look at the areas on the Asian map in green, we see a slight concentration kind of, I'd say, toward the western, southwestern corner of the district. And it's a slight concentration. It's not like an, an area that's large enough for a district in and of itself, but it's probably a, a few census blocks there that should be kept together if possible. As I mentioned before, we'll have our interactive review map, which um, will be this map reviewing tool that will have all this demographic data in it as well. Um, and what, when we actually produce the maps, we'll put them onto this review tool as well, so you'll be able to see how they overlay all the different demographic maps. Well, we love this tool because it's like Google Maps. You can search for addresses, you can search for locations, you can zoom in and out to see the streets, you can turn on the overhead topography if you want to see uh, aerial photographs of the area rather than the streets. Uh, it offers a lot of power and a lot of detail when you want to analyze the maps. In addition, we are producing a map drawing tool. This is sort of a paint by census block tool. Um, in, um, in addition to our training at the next meeting, we're also going to have a, two videos online, a short four minute get started video and a longer 15 minute detailed how to use video and a PowerPoint presentation that literally walks you step by step from starting the process to submitting a map. Um, we, had, we, we do also have set up an email address that you'll email your map when you're finished to the district as well. All of that will be on the district's districting website. And so with that, I thank you for your time and I'm happy to address any questions you have tonight. So, I apologize. Um, if you can bounce back to, I think it's slide 15. So I get, this, is, this is field data, but um, you have Hispanic, Latino in the total population, you have Hispanic, and then you have uh, non, not Hispanic, the NH, Asian Pacific Island, and Asian Pacific Island are down low. Is there a way, is there a operational definition where things can be combined so that we're always looking at similar data? And then how is this data, where is it pulled from? So, um, so the, these two are the same fields I, 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 for the total population and the citizen voting age population. The first one does come from the 2020 census. The second box comes from the American Community Survey. There's actually a special database that the Department of Justice uses to calculate citizen voting age population, and that's where those numbers come from. Okay, so from an analysis standpoint, can we make a table, can we make a reference sheet that says if it's HISP or Hispanic Latino, we're all talking about the same things, or are we always gonna chop it up? So 
Because um, at some point you're going to want to stack the data across, and you're you're yeah. you're going to have categories that aren't going to be representative. Yeah. So in here we're using the terminology from our source material, so that if you were to go to the census website and look at that particular survey, fair. This is the term. This is the term you would. So search again, for. so from an analysis standpoint, can we? as a group say this, 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 and this term all equal this, and then we're actually able to look and evaluate the data a little easier, or do we always have to go back to census data and cross because things aren't gonna line up and they're gonna create questions. Well, does, does Asian Pacific Islander down below and the citizen voting age equal the same thing as non-Hispanic Asian Pacific Islander? So it's a, really, it's, a really, it's a really technical question and I wanna mm -hmm. give it the time that it, it merits. And the answer is that each of these surveys has a slightly different way of calculating these results. So the citizen voting age population is an estimate that the census conducts using its American Community Survey or 8% of the population every year data. Um, it's the one that the courts require, but it's the one, it, that's the methodology they use to capture it. It's a little bit different than the 100% sample that the census itself aims for. It's very different from the voting and registration data because the voting and registration data doesn't actually use self-reported data at all. It uses surname data. And so one of the things we have to be very clear about is, up, and I'm being very upfront about all the differences in the way that these data sets are collected. And one of the reasons why we present so many different versions is exactly because of this question of which one do we trust? We know which one the courts require us we use and which ones the courts have used in the past, and we report that. But it's not going to be a perfect lineup. Okay, so I get, fair. I'm just saying from an analysis standpoint of any of us and anybody in the community, you're gonna start looking at different things. Is there a way to this and this and this all equal the same thing in general so that we don't, say, at some point, we're going to start splitting hairs, and yeah. I just like to keep the conversation moving as people, because, again, with a short timeline. So if there's a way to make a legend or a key, it would be very helpful to, mm -hmm. to have that as opposed to, and then, again, it allows you to format the data and look across as opposed to vertical. Justin, this may address that. So how come, if, we're, if the court orders us to use the total population, why do we have this information in addition? So that's a really good question, and the reason is is because the courts actually have two different sets of rulings. The first set of ruling deals with the one person, one vote, equal population standard. And for that, the courts require we use the total population on top. However, the voting rights, all the cases on voting rights, especially here in California where Latino community and the Asian community have been at the center of a lot of voting rights issues, the courts have used the citizen voting age population um, because it only accounts for eligible voters, not total, and, and so it doesn't capture those that are 18 or perhaps not citizens, the way that our total population count does. And so this is why we have the two data sets. The first, the top total population, we use that for balancing, equaling, making sure each district has the same number of residents. The second, citizen voting age population, and the reason we use it on the maps here is because when it comes to voting rights questions and concerns, that's what the courts have required. And I understand it's very confusing, and um, you know, but that is basically what the legal picture is. They don't make your job very easy, law. do they? No. Um, I, I, I understand. I'm just thank you. Again, from I, I guess I guess where. If there were extreme differences, so if the total population of, let's go back to you know, Hispanic Latino were 85%, but then the voting percentage was like 25, I could see that. Given that numbers are similar for Rockland, percentages are similar, does that then lend the, we can combine or we can look to put things together or at well, least draw similarities? Well, I would say that in terms of focusing on voting rights, we are definitely focused on the citizen voting age population numbers. The total population numbers may be interesting, but that's not where our focus is. Our focus is on the citizen voting age population. Okay. So then... So the only difference that I see from our perspective, if, if you know, we're wanting to take in 
details specific and particular school district the difference between those a lot of times is going to be children absolutely um, mm -hmm. and, and and that really is that really is this question of communities of interest and in neighborhoods um, at its heart mm -hmm. uh, because even if we can't see something just in the purely numeric numbers uh, like for example um, right now you know our numbers suggest two percent of the population is african-american if there is a historic African-American community or neighborhood somewhere, or that has an identity as having a history, a specific history, let's say there was um, a historic Asian community in a particular part of the district, that still enters our considerations as a community of interest under the second part, okay. even if it doesn't rise to a federal challenge. So when you present the maps, you'll lay all of that on top of each other, and so we can see it, take it off, look through the so, specifics? And so, yes, our interactive review map actually has all of the different fields in there so that you can choose what you view, how okay. you view it. So you'll be able to overlay any of the maps with any of our demographic fields with the, that we have. Okay. Um, and in addition to that, when we discuss each of the maps, when I go through them, if there are particular considerations given to a community of interest that has been mentioned, then we can certainly talk about that as well. Each map will have a demographic spreadsheet attached to it with this information, or sorry, with all of this information broken out by each of the five trustee areas. So you can compare them. So then on that map tool that you were referencing, I see that drop down menu, and it has a lot of pretty specific criteria listed on there, like um, percent multifamily housing, households with children. Um, you know, education level. So in creating the maps, are all of those potential areas looked at and basically you're looking for that purple, blue, if any of those more specific criteria, there was a population that kind of popped, then that would be, it would have to be considered or if it's kind of not one of the main priorities and it created that's a good question, and let me, let me say that we have a lot of these demographic fields, and some of them have very different patterns from each other. Uh, as you know, I was looking at some of them as I was putting together the tool and the presentation, and you'd be surprised how some of them don't correlate at all. Um, okay. And so part of our process is when we present you some maps, they'll show, some, they'll show differences between them. They'll have some things we considered in one map, but not so in another. Because what we're trying to get at is what is important. And every district we go to, people talk about different specific issues. Um, one district, it might be something like, we really care about this one area where they have the multifamily housing that really is a specific community of interest. And the next district we go to says, we have apartments everywhere. Why don't we, we don't care about apartments. We really want to focus in on this neighborhood that doesn't have children because it's a retirement community. Mm -hmm and they have a specific need to stay together. Um, that, and so yeah, none of these, none of the columns in this, none of the fields in the second column have any bearing to the Voting Rights Act whatsoever. They're all just to provide information about the community. Help us identify okay. things Customize like- Customize it to Rockland. You know, if there's, there's a retirement community or university that might be impacted by school districts in particular very differently from areas that are mostly made up of families with children. And there are some areas in the district where over 90% of the families have children at home. And there's other parts of the district where it's much lower than that. So mm -hmm. those are the kind of things that we can look at as well um, in this using all of this data. And, and sometimes, I guess yeah. go on the same lines and then it's the conversation of how to prioritize that. This one goes above that one or that one goes above this one. Well, and that's what the different maps show. So one map might might really emphasize, you know, or may, might have some emphasis given to a particular factor. Um, like, you know, we wanted to make sure that in this map, um, that the a concentration, I don't know, of, um, we might, you know, just, just to throw out an example, we might, we might say this one, we've tried to put more of the multifamily housing together. And so we have one district or two districts that have a majority of renters or a majority of multifamily housing, and the other three areas have majority owners. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's actually the numbers for the district yeah. or not, but um, that would be the kind of thing that might that, that, that sometimes become up as potential communities of interest. 
And if you or any community members bring up other communities of interest, um, like for example, you know, planned communities, developments, or with homeowners associations, or even just you know, shared, like shared building identities. And I know this is a newer community, and so a lot of these are more planned. Developments are more planned. Um, mm -hmm. Then that, those are also the kinds of things that we can use as communities of interest building blocks to show you different options. So with that, being that there are some newer communities, you and you, I had written down a question and you did touch on it, <clears throat> sorry, allergies, um, related to the use of the 2020 census, since that happens every 10 years, but that, you know, there has been development in these, you know, this period of time since that census. And so we, we would consider that, but we can't really project, would we be able to consider existing on top of the 2020, but not project so, other, or? So the, it gets complicated <clears throat> because of course, the law is written for redistricting in the year after the census, the year the census results come out. So always, and so we are always every 10 years. So redistricting okay. always happens in the year ending in one, maybe at the beginning of the year ending so in two, in before there's too much change that happens. But yeah. the rule is right. you always use the latest census. Um, and that is actually a, that is actually federal. It's not just applies to our state. It's a federal requirement for equal population that we use the most recent census results. Perfect. Um, Thank you. And as you said, every 10 years, we'll get new results. Um, now, in terms of growth, we can incorporate the growth, in particular future growth or planned growth or, you know, um, as sort of a balancing if we're going to look at we like this map or we really like these two maps this map does a better job dividing that new growth or in some cities or districts putting that growth in one area uh, depending on what makes sense for the community um, and that's something you can consider as a final balancing between two maps so if you can bump to I think it's slide 19 and it just has a rough picture of Rockland um, you talked about census blocks as those lines. Are those the same as voting districts? So, so these are voted. So these are the precincts okay. um, that the from the county. If you click on any of these precincts, it will subdivide that precinct into the component blocks in the tool. Okay. And the reason for that is a memory so they, um, issue. In order to run this effectively over the internet, if it tried to load in the hundreds of blocks at once. It could take hours to load, so instead it only loads in one precinct at a time, depending on what you're doing. But it gives you the precinct totals, like the, the, the precinct numbers, so that you can see, hey, if I this is below the population I'm aiming for, I can keep it all together. I guess where I was going is with that, would, would we want to, I guess those would be natural lines so that if you have a person voting for a trustee, You'd want to keep those contiguous, or you want you you wouldn't want to start chopping those up because then half of the vote of the people in that area, of that precinct or whatever, goes to one versus the other. So um, I would warn you against that actually, because um, precincts can be they can be boundaries, but oftentimes they have to be redrawn every time there's a new election. So these were the precinct boundaries in use as of the when this data set was put together. Um, if you, if you find the need to divide a precinct in order to get your boundary, like let's say, you, like let's say you know, you, there's a major road and you wanna make it along that road, but the precinct boundary crosses that road. You, we do encourage you to go down to those census blocks and use the road rather than just keeping the precinct together. Essentially, precincts have to be redrawn for every election anyway, so there's nothing special about these precincts. Yeah. So just to clarify, so essentially the census data is every 10 years, but you're saying the precincts would be every election. So adhering our 10-year decision to a precinct decision that might change every election could cause some concern. I would say that, yeah, you know, obviously if it makes sense to keep the whole area together, then you'd want to keep it together. But if it doesn't make sense to keep that area together, go with the criteria rather than keeping the precinct together arbitrarily. Um, I say that because a lot of the precincts do follow major roads and other things, but there's also roads that precincts don't follow because 
maybe there just aren't enough voters in that particular neighborhood. And then on, uh, I guess, in similar lines, our school boundaries for elementary school, for middle school, and high schools would be on this on these maps as layers, essentially, right now. So, correct? yes, um, we can. We, well, you can definitely, you know, we definitely want to put them on, um, and they can be considered communities of interest. Um, I'll just warn you that sometimes, for population reasons or other things, they may have to be divided. You might have to chop up the school, but. Um, you know, uh, some districts choose to use the elementary or middle school, or depending on how big the district yeah. is, high school, as communities. Others choose not to. So it's an option. It's available if you'd like. Okay. And then on slide 17, those are the pictures. Are those, those are actual representative maps now. They're not just generics, right? So these are specific maps using the citizen voting age population data. Okay. So then I guess just more curious. Uh, the Latino citizen voting age population map, there's a light blue circle in the middle, which is essentially Twin Oaks Park and Rockland Little League. Mm -hmm. But then, so I, I'm just trying to understand how. So the census blocks represent the actual physical geography. Um, some so of them. park shopping centers are included or aren't included? So they, they are included, everywhere is included, including some, you see the white areas? Mm -hmm. They have no people in them, but they still have a census block that covers them. And many of these census blocks, for example, in the Asian citizen voting age population map, there's a big green block along the western end of the uh -huh. district. There aren't a lot of people, I think there's, there's seven people there, yeah. in that block as of the 2020 census. But it's green because of the seven, I believe four of them are Asian. So. Uh, this is a percentage, remember that. So then, that, uh, and then, so the other thing is, so underneath where it says Lone Tree Boulevard, that little triangle area, which mm -hmm. is essentially strikes and tractor supply, it's the same percentage of 35 to 50% in both Asian and Latino? Yes, and, and there's it nothing may, there. It may be there's that <laughs> there's two residents there and one is Latino and one is Asian. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, and that would get you 50 50. Um, and so that, that is one of the challenges of census geography. You will see thousand person blocks that are tiny and one person blocks that are massive. And that is because they do represent the actual physical environment. Okay. And that's why we encourage you to go to our map review tool because you'll, we have the blocks on there, of course. So you can click on a block and see how many people are actually in that block. And you'll be able to on our online drawing tool as well. And then future maps as they go as, I guess, and as you've seen it, if the school district in any, any respective city, the map they have or the separations they have could be different than the city council map or the fire district or whatever the other ones are, correct? In fact, they're very likely to be. I mean, I put up um, the, city, the, the map here because we do have the city of Rockland on the map. And its borders are not exactly the same as the districts. Mm -hmm. They're very close, but there's also um, a couple little pieces that are in the district, but not in Rockland, but are maybe in other cities. Um, and you know, no, some of them are zero population, but okay. uh, and it, just as in many parts of California, the districts and the cities are, were formed at different times. Thank you, Dr. Levitt and Ms. Cannon. I appreciate the presentation and the clarification for us. At this time, we will now need to officially open the first public hearing to gather community input regarding composition of trustee area boundaries pursuant to elections code section 10010A1. Hearing is now open. Any public comments for consideration? Seeing none, any additional trustee comments? Hearing none, I will now close the public hearing. And that will conclude our public hearing for the evening. Thank you both for your assistance this evening. Okay, we'll now move on to 
Item 9.1, the consent calendar. All matters listed under the consent calendar are to be considered routine and will be enacted by one motion followed by a roll call vote. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless the Board of Trustees requests specific items to be removed from the consent calendar for separate discussion and action. Any items removed will be voted upon following the motion to approve the consent calendar. Do any trustees wish to remove an item from the consent calendar for separate discussion and action? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve consent agenda items? So moved. Moved by Second. Trustee Price. Second by Trustee Hupp. Georgia, will you please call the roll? Julie Hupp? Yes. Rochelle Price? Yes. Derek Counter? Yes. Michelle Sutherland? Yes. Tiffany Sadoff? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, we will now move on to item 10.1. Action on our 2023-2024 second interim report. I would like to welcome Deputy Superintendent Business and Operations, Jennifer Stahlerber. Good evening, President Setoff, uh, governing board members, and Superintendent Stock. And let me start the slide here. Okay. So tonight we're gonna review our second interim budget report. And so this is just um, an illustration of where we are on our budget cycle. So this is a second of two interims that we bring to you during the year. Um, the last time we were here, we were sharing an update with the governor's budget that had been released in January. And this is a review of our revenues with a comparison between first interim and second interim. On, and on the farthest right column, you can see the variance. And so you can see we had some increases in our LCFF projections. And that's based on an approval of our J13A waiver, which was related to the 22-23 school year. We submitted one for the, um, to recover attendance during the COVID uh, proclamation that ended in, I believe, February of 23. So any of those dates prior to that where we were below our normal attendance rate, we submitted for um, recovery of those funds. And so it was approved recently and we were able to submit it in our second interim budget. Our federal revenues increased, and that was a variety. We had some increases in Title I. We saw some increases in our Title II, our IDEA, which are special ed funds. We had a little tiny decrease in our Title II, so the net effect was an increase of just over 67,000. Our other state revenues um, are also multiple resources, and so we had some increases in prior year unrestricted and restricted lottery, which is very typical, the state is always settling up in multiple years, just like how you'll see we'll bring back and have different numbers um, at the end of the year. They're doing that as well. Um, we also saw some additional funds in our expanded learning opportunity program. And in our art and music, we had a slight reduction of just over 24,000. Um, so our total increase in our other state revenues was 195,000. Uh, in our other local sources, uh, we saw an increase of over a million dollars. A big portion of that was related to interest earnings. So right now the treasury pool is doing better than it had in prior years. And so we saw an increase of 280,000 based on projections for current activity. And um, we also saw an increase of 283,000 for Medi-Cal reimbursements. And that's an item that fluctuates from year to year. So when we project it, we tend to be more conservative because we don't really know what's gonna happen until they audit the years and we're multiple years in arrears. So that's when you'll typically see fluctuate from year to year. Um, and we saw some increases in some grants, including um, reef grant and site donations. And oops, I'll move forward again. And so this is um, a chart for total revenues, and it shows the breakdown. As you can see, the majority of our revenues come from LCFF. So our local control funding formula is comprised of state aid, property taxes, in the Education Protection Act funds. And if you recall, that was passed quite some time ago. I don't recall what year anymore, but um, it increased the taxes on our highest earners in the state and it increased some um, uh, sales tax revenues. And so this is a comparison uh, from first interim to second interim and it shows a variance for our expenditures. And so you'll see typically some adjustments in our salaries and that's because we're looking at any vacancies that haven't been filled and making adjustments based on how much time has passed and we only have this many months left and so what's the potential budget that we might have 
if those positions are filled. We also make adjustments based on when we do fill those positions. Um, when we use budget, we're using an average. But when we hire someone, maybe they come in with little experience and they're lower, and that's a savings. Or maybe they come in with greater experience, and so we budget for that. And then that also carries through to the benefits. Our books and supplies, we had um, a significant reduction, but you'll see most of that was shifted to other categories. So we had sites or departments that shift from books and supplies into some services and other operating expenditures. Um, and you can see our services and other operating expenditures grew by 1.4. Again, that was a shift from some of those other categories, including our capital outlay. And um, I'm sure you all loved that narrative we provided. And so if you read through that, you saw where we, we actually outlined the details of those shifts between you know, the capital outlay to the services and other operating and from the supplies and materials. Um, we were pretty flat in the other areas other than our transfers of indirect, and that is because that expenditure that you see there, although it's a negative expenditure, it's because we're getting indirect, we're recovering it from other funds. And this is just a summary for our general fund. So when we have something change in another fund, it's going to change the indirect. And then this is a breakdown of our expenditures. And something to note here is that, um, oh, and I had some information on this. So our, um, darn it, where did I put, oh, here it is. Okay, um, our total amount right now for salaries and benefits is sitting at 79% based on our current projections, but that is not a typical um, percentage than when we close our books. Typically, we're closer to 84 to 86%, but also when we close our books, all the carryover is not sitting in those 4,000s and 5,000s. And typically, we experience about 1 million to 2 million in those two categories. Um, that drops out and it gets carried over. It's usually like donations at our sites or in departments or some of our planned expenditures that didn't occur because we didn't, weren't able to fill positions or maybe we had some issues with supplies coming in because of shipping delays and so it just gets moved into that next year. So that's part of why that number looks lower right now. But we also had another issue in our capital outlay where we had some bus grants. We received $3 million in bus grants, but we also have 3.1 million in um, expenditures for those bus grants, which are reflected here, but you don't see that offsetting revenue. So because it increased that um, category, it automatically is gonna make the other categories look smaller in our overall expenditures. So I think when we close the books, we'll probably be much closer, maybe that 84 rather than the 86. But I went back and looked at the data from 2018-19 through 22-23, and we're always in that range. Um, this chart I added um, because, you know, I'm still learning a lot about the district and in that last uh, board meeting we had some questions and some information that was shared um, in bu public comment about legal fees. So it made me want to go back and look at it. And as I looked at it, I realized, oh, well, some of that information that was shared I think was based on budget, not on actual expenditures. And then it made me really want to look at, well, where are we right now? So I brought in some historical data and you can see I included budget and then I included where we actually expended those funds, where we ended at the end of the year. And there's, there's gonna be a fluctuation because as we, um, maybe we start an investigation, you know, we're gonna budget based kind of on worst case scenario just so we're prepared. But we don't always enclose an investigation in the year that it started. So maybe we thought it'd be wrapped up, but some of that's gonna carry over into another year. It could also be maybe we have um, a lawsuit that we know is pending and we don't know Right, so if we have like an amount that a parent has listed that they're trying to recover and we don't know what it might end up being, we're gonna use best case scenario because maybe it's gonna drag out further, but we're gonna be really conservative and budget so that we don't have um, a negative surprise as we're closing the books. And so you can see how it fluctuates. Um, and you can see in current year, we're actually doing pretty well. Um, now what isn't reflected, these are just through March 15th, which was only our invoices through January. We did just run a batch of checks, which we do once a week, um, which had our February invoices, and that came to about $34,000. So that would grow by that much. Um, but and then we still have the rest of this year that, that'll be booked. So when we come back at Unaudit Actuals, if you wanted to know that line, we could look at that. So I guess just one real quick question then. For 23-24, again, you're, we're looking at about 286. That's about half the school year, right? So. Yeah, over it was through, half. It was so, through so, January. If, yep. so, so if you just ballpark doubled it, and got to 573, that's what you could assume. I mean, I, where I'm going is 
we always actually bring, or we actually pay less than we budget. And I think that's a great thing, great thing to be at. So thank you for that. Okay, and this is just um, a summary at a high level of our general fund, and it shows you know total revenues, total expenditures, um, with an increase or decrease. Do you have any additional questions? I can go back if you'd like. Okay. We don't want to interrupt, um, mm -hmm. but we were just wondering on that. I thank you for the clarification on that. Could you speak to what these legal fees are? It'll be legal fees for special education. Um, you know, we had some prior years where we were doing some land negotiations that would have involved legal fees. If we had a settlement that goes through the attorney, so settlements can be paid directly to the recipient or it can be paid through the legal, through the attorney, which would be coded to a legal fee. So it would be captured within there, yeah. So typically those special ed tend to be our biggest area. But in that year of COVID, I think all districts experienced a lot of extra legal fees as well because you know we were hearing lots of different guidance and so I think everyone was running everything by their, their legal team. Uh, the, the other thing I would note is um, we also have, ex beyond the working hard to make our special education programs in, in a better space with our families, we also, um, in the 1920 year, for example, um, were, were um, having to need our legal counsel to be at the negotiations table, and that is very costly. So one of the results of having a better collaborative experiences is that we don't incur the legal fees related to negotiations with our labor partners, and that's, that's part of that as well. Okay, so back to that summary. And so you can see that um, if you look at first interim compared to second interim, the deficits decrease are projected. Most of that's sitting in restricted, and it's planned deficit where we those funds we received for COVID, ESSER, gear that we received in prior years, but we're spending it because we're um, we have some learning recovery going on. That that's sitting in there, um, and the reason it's reduced is because we had a reduction in our overall expenditures and we had an increase in our overall revenues. So that's good. We that's a positive trend. We like that. Um, and so as, as such, you'll see our unrestricted and non-committed uh, percentage increase from the 12.06 to 13.14. And then you can see the breakdown of those fund balance components. So we have our assigned funds, we have our reserve for economic uncertainty, which is the state required amount, which is 3% for a district of our size. And then we have the remaining unassigned funds. And so you can see that also grew. And so the next slide, we're gonna actually break down those components in further detail. So our commitment, our, oops, our committed funds, we have some facility use and repair, and that's some revenues that come in that are specifically um, for repairing. So like we have an agreement with um, Rockland Charter Academy. And so some of that agreement, we get facility funds. And so we hold those in a reserve, in a restricted account in case there's some repairs needed. Um, we have textbook adoption instructional materials, so we always have a plan, and I believe you know it's, it can be anywhere from six to eight years where we're projecting out, and that's so that we just don't end up in a year where we have, a, again, a negative surprise. And so we're always updating this based on current information, updated counts, you know, what our demographic reports are reflecting. And so we, there was a year that got added in here, and we also had some movement, so that's why that grew from first interim to second interim. Um, we had some discrete site discretionary carryover fund projected at this time. So every time we're looking at it, if we know there's a program or a site that they know they're not gonna spend all their funds and they can let us know now, we can go ahead and reduce and know that that's carryover, but we wanna commit it because it's site funds. It's not gonna go back into the general fund for other expenditures. And it's typically funds that are like donation funds, um, grant funds that we know are gonna carry over and be used in that next year. Because it, it, for interim, it's still so early in the year, because that's as of October 31st, the sites still typically don't have a good idea of what they're gonna carry over into that next year. Um, our learning recovery plan, um, that is a commitment we have to spend those funds in 24-25 and some in 25-26 right now, um, and, but it's all sitting in there, that two million. Our technology, we made a commitment for our equipment replacement plan. I mean, that is, again, is over two years, so 500,000 in 24, 25, 500,000 in 25, 26. We have some mental health programs that we're also supplementing out of general fund to keep those services right now as, we're, as part of our learning recovery plan. And then we also had um, attendance mitigation. And so if you recall, at first interim, we were still using the 93.5 based on last year's attendance rates. But we also started last year um, 
really working on how can we improve attendance. And I think we shared in our recent presentation that they did a really amazing job with a lot of the programs that were piloted. And so we, at, at second interim, decided let's, we're, we're on track to maybe hit 95.5, so that's what we used. So um, fingers crossed, last time I checked, we were at like 95.51. So um, as long as that comes in, we're looking good, but that was a significant decrease to what we're having to commit in that fund balance to make up for that gap that we were missing. Um, we also have estimated increase in our special ed. So um, we got some new numbers, but they're for the future year, so in an NYP, it might look a little different. And you would have seen that in those assumptions that were included in that narrative for those out years. Um, and then we also have the, just the deficit spending mitigation. So what that is looking at is, are we, do we have a deficit in our unrestricted? And if so, let's commit this fund balance right now so we can cover it. And part of that is so that we have time to make adjustments in our budget where we're not having to be knee-jerk. And just as Travis acknowledged earlier, and as we've discussed as a board and as a, a cabinet team is, we're really committed to not touching positions and people. We wanna maintain the services and programs that we've grown and committed in our learning recovery plan. And so when because of the decrease to the projected COLA from a 3.94 to a 0.76, that's a big hit to those unrestricted revenues. And so that grew that projected deficit, even though we have that increased attendance rate, um, it grew it because of that loss of that COLA. So that's what that commitment is. Assignments, that some of that is some supplemental carryover. And so we just make that assigned rather than committed because it's not restricted dollars. Um, and we have some flexibility in how those funds are used. Um, other site department carryover, that stayed the same. And then charter equipment replacement, that was also the same. Any questions before I move on? So this is our MYP, and you can see um, we do show some uh, deficits in those out years. A big chunk of those are restricted funds still, because we're still spinning down the art and music um, instructional material block grants that we received in a prior year, but we have multiple years to spend it down. And we also have the learning recovery emergency block grant. And those funds are all part of that learning um, recovery plan that we talked about. And some of those committed funds that we just talked about that were general fund are helping have a really robust and rich program moving forward for the next couple of years. Um, we still stay above and able to have our uh, reserve for economic uncertainty, um, but you can see it is slowly starting to go down. So when we come back at adopted, we're gonna have an additional year in here. And so when you see those out years, that's why we're having those conversations. We're partnering with our labor partners to really talk about how can we um, maintain services but also make the reductions we need to do to keep um, fiscally stable. And so this is just a summary of our other funds. So when we, when we do our interims for our general fund, which is our main fund, we also update any assumptions in our um, other funds. So, you know, Fund 13 is cafeteria, deferred maintenance. You can see most of them are stable. They haven't had a lot of difference. If you went and looked back at first interim um, to second interim, you can see the activity is not not significant, it really is related to just the minor adjustments. You know, cafeteria, our numbers come in differently. Um, any questions related to this? Okay. And so uh, we're gonna have a positive certification. We're healthy, we show we can meet our um, obligations in the current year, plus two. And then our next steps is we're just gonna um, keep an eye out for that May revise. So, you know, we're gonna continue to monitor our budget. Um, we're all gonna attend that workshop. Um, a big chunk of us and our labor partners. And then uh, we'll be back in June with our adopted budget. Any other questions? I just wanted to thank you for the narrative as well. I actually did like having all of those sections defined um, toward the end because sometimes those are things that come up, but it's nice to have that question answered before I get here, so thank you. Thank you. No board comments or, oh. Questions? Great, we do have one public comment, so I'll go ahead and go to public comment on this item 10.1. We have Alicia Watkins. <laughs> um, hi board, um, thank you for the time and thank you for that awesome report. Um, 
It was, uh, when I saw the last meeting, I was very concerned about hearing about the legal fees. Honestly, when you hear that we're um, projected to hit a million dollars, that had me in panic mode, and I'm not even from this district. My district, where my son is, is currently facing very serious economic issues. And so it scared me to think there might be another district that could be looking at that. Um, I do have concern about um, what this district might be looking at in the future with the gamble of possibly losing federal funding with the lawsuit, with what we don't know about what's happening with the reef funding. Um, I don't know if that ties in at all. Um, I think uh, that's one thing maybe the Rockland community would like to hear about is what's going on, um, how the lack of reef funding, if it is ceased, would um, affect anything at all. Um, but it is nice to see everything laid out in detail. I do appreciate that. Um, I just want to say um, my, my child's district, AUSD, has been kicking the financial can down the road for 15 years. No one of us had any idea of how bad it was. And where we are at right now, everybody is scrambling. We've lost busing. We've closed two schools. Um, and we've lost a significant amount of really good teachers. And everybody is working really hard to bring things back together. But there are children that are going home every day crying because they don't even know what school they're going to be going to next year. And I don't wish that upon any school district. So thank you for the hard work you guys are doing. And um, like I said, I'm not from this district, but I think a lot of people in the Rockland community would definitely appreciate very transparent information coming at them just to put them all at ease. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Alicia. Any other public comment on this item? No? Okay, any additional questions or comments, trustees? Is there a motion to approve the interim report? So moved. Second. First, first by Trustee Sutherland, second by Trustee Price. Georgia, will you please call the roll? Julie Hupp? Yes. Rochelle Price? Yes. Derek Counter? Yes. Michelle Sutherland? Yes. Tiffany Sadoff? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you again for your incredible work. I know that those reports uh, are, are very indicative of many, many hours. Uh, so I appreciate you for laying it out so clearly. And I do wanna echo the written report was incredibly beneficial to be able to read why we're able to make the assumptions we're making. So thank you. Thank you, but I, you know, I, if I was remiss if I didn't mention, I failed to thank my fiscal services team. They're amazing, they did an amazing job. Um, and I couldn't do it without them, especially as green as I am. So oh. I appreciate that. Well, thank you to the entire team. It is important that everybody Great hears the thank you. So thank you. <laughs> I'm long in the tooth otherwise. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. At this time, we'll move on to item 11.1. .1. I now invite Craig Rouse, our Senior Director of Facilities, Maintenance, and Operations, to join Jennifer Stolliber to present the Portable Building Replacement Project Delivery Building Comparison. Info item 11.1. .1 you're getting the both of us for this presentation. Um, okay. So uh, we started with just a recap of, you know, where this started and why we're here and some of the dates that have transpired in between. Um, and this was a good exercise for me as I wasn't here for all these dates. Um, but I was here for the January 30th uh, study session where we had some additional questions. And so that's why we're here tonight is to bring some information that um, we had mul multiple trustees ask about. So when we talked about some of our needs, um, there were some delivery method questions. Oops. And so um, this, this slide is identifying like, well, where did we start? When we started uh, this process to, look, to create the, our new five-year facility master plan, one of the items that was assessed was our portables. And the original assessment looked at what, are, what portables, how many do we have that exceed 20 years? And so originally that number came in at 90, and that's a really high number. And um, you know, right now they're very expensive, prices have gone up on those. And so we started having more detailed conversations, but also we're limited by the, the funding sources we have. And so that's shaped some of the conversations we've had as well. And so you can see in this next slide, uh, Craig and his team did a lot of work to do a deeper assessment into what are our highest needs that we need to do some work to replace um, right now. And so based on some criteria, which included you know, condition, 
which was looking at exterior, it was looking at painting, it was looking at the inside, do we have leaks, do we have other areas of need? It looked at healthy health and safety concerns. Um, we were able to bring that down to 61 that are identified right now um, that are the highest level need for replacement. No, nope, it's in order based, thank you. Yeah, and you can join me up there. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, that was based on high. So the, the highest rank are the, the first group and then on down. So we had portable replacements and we have other portable projects and you can see that we have different funding that we can use for each one. So we have some based on funding source availability and assessment, and then we have the portable additions that were based on growth and our site needs. And so if you remember that one sheet that had the capital facility projects where we were projecting how to spend that $58 million, these items were listed in there. There's also, um, you know, I noted a little star on those ones on the left, the nine at Twin Oaks and or Breen and the 23 Twin Oaks, Antelope Creek, Breen, you know, pending decisions. You're gonna see those um, come in on that cost comparison slide on slide 18. And so now I'm gonna hand it off to my partner. Thank you, Jennifer. Good evening. So I'm, I'm gonna pick it up from here and uh, what I'm gonna be talking about is, you know, the overview of what's a portable classroom building, modular classroom building, and a permanent built classroom. And compare what, what, what they are, how they're built, how they're delivered, and then cost comparisons on each delivery method. And then next steps. So portable classroom building, uh, these, these buildings are built on an off-site manufacturing uh, facility, and they're, they're trucked in. In, in two pieces, a, a 960 classroom, 960 square foot classroom is, comes in two pieces. And they're either you know, dropped off, dropped into the, the, found, uh, the area where we um, have the dirt pad uh, by truck or they're craned. And um, they're set on a, a dirt pad with wood foundations. Uh, these portable classrooms typically have a 25 to 30 year lifespan and you know, they can be picked up and relocated based on demographic needs. We've talked about that multiple times. So with the portable classroom building, this is the, the most cost effective and um, time saving way to get a project approval. So it's a, it's a limited, you know, least amount of time for the portable manufacturer and also through DSA to go ahead and get it approved and out to bid for uh, project installation. This photo here, um, I, I wanted to put this in here just to show you what uh, our latest portable building that we installed over at Cory Trail. And if you can you know, think about back what portables were built 26 years ago, how they were brought in and how they look now, they really look, the, the style is different. We try and make them look real similar to the existing uh, brick and mortar buildings. And um, so we're, we've really upgraded these the manufacturers have over the years, the, these moment steel frame buildings and it's just a more solid feeling build. build. Can, I, okay. can I ask you a question on that? Sure. So a lot of our portables um, are up on, you know, it's a stairway to get to them. So okay. when we, a ramp, yeah. When we replace those, would they be on the ground or would they still have the ramp? They would be flush mount. So this, this portable here that we installed at Quarry Trail is, is a flush mount. Flush so, mount. So, so we're moving away from uh, the ramps, because it's more maintenance down the road, and it looks aesthetically better, and um, it's it's just a better application, right, just to go right in in the classroom. So Can it's a little I bit more foundation work. Sorry, George. I just want to add to that question, because this looks like it's on a um, cement foundation, but the in the description it says that the portables are on a dirt foundation. The, this portable is on a dirt foundation. Okay. Um, and since it's a flush mount, they have to dig out 18 inches, and it's a dirt pad, they compact it, and then what they do is they pour a curb around the portable building where the vents go in, so, so the airflow goes underneath the floor. And so that, that's what you see in the concrete, is the actual curb around it. Okay. Any other questions on this? So I just want to mention thank you for, so I went, because we've talked about these a couple times now in our um, reviews of you know, facilities, and 
wanted to kind of see exactly what we were talking about. So I appreciate you taking me to kind of look through. So I went to see one of the original portables in the annex at Rockland High. And then next door is a, an aluminum frame portable. And then went on to campus and saw one of the, not necessarily original, but close to modular on cement foundation. Portable, but on cement foundation, correct? Concrete footing, yeah. And then, <laughs> and then saw the, the con constructed building right next to it. And so I just, I appreciate, they definitely, and, and I walked by this one, it actually looks nicer now at Cory Trail because the construction fence and the landscaping is all done. Um, so given, you know, kind of how things have changed and, you know, what this Catalyst Kids portable looks like and the ones that will continue to get put onto Cory Trail, I guess, I mean, that was one of my questions that um, Trustee Price asked about the flush. So we would not be looking at any ramp, ramp portables. They would all be this kind of flush mount. Correct, with the, with okay. the concrete sidewalk in front, flush entry. And, and eliminating the ramps. Okay, right. So then, and this is very well integrated into the design of Cory Trail. So with each site, you know, proposed to get portables, would we, would we also be seeing some renderings of how those would integrate with the design, the existing design of those campuses as well? Yes, we could bring those back. And um, when, when we design, whether it's a, a brick and mortar or a permanent building or a portable building, it's based off of our, our educational specifications and our new district standards that we brought to, you know, to the board in 2018. So this, you know, if you look at the windows in front of this portable, they're the same windows that we put in this, the permanent built right next to it. Um, we match the paint line. As you go inside, we have the same flooring. We have the same carpet. We have the same cabinets. Um, the, the, you know, as far as the bathroom in this portal, we have the same toilet accessory, you know, the, the uh, flush valves are the same. So as a district, we're starting to get our district standards in there. It's the same quality building as far as the finishes go inside. So when you walk in that classroom, you're not going to see more upgrades in a permanent built than you would in a, a portable building. Can I ask but, a question about that? Were you done? Well, and I did just want to mention, too, that I, I don't think I had realized, but in going through those different buildings, the interior finishes, you know, whether it's the portable or the constructed, aside from the carpet in the construct, construction one, um, it's all like the walls are the same material. You know, those um, L L v LVT, right? Oh. The tiles are the same, the, the sink fixtures and all that. So I just like if I had just been like planted into one of those rooms without walking in, I, it would be really hard, I think, for me to tell a, a measurable di difference. So actually that was one of my questions. So I know the TK portables have to have bathrooms, but the the regular portables that, I mean, the 61 portables, are they going to have plumbing and sinks and permanent cabinetry and all those things as well? So the the um, lower grades, K through TK through 6, will have, they have to have sinks. Um, the TK portables have to have a bathroom. They, they will have bathrooms in the design. But the, the general ed classrooms, the, the smaller ones, the 960 square foot, general ed, will just have a sink in front because they're the lower grades. Okay, so they do have sinks. Yes. And do they have permanent cabinets as yes. well? Well, it's, it's interesting because our, as our educational specs, we've moved away from built-in cabinets and we have more flex furniture. So um, if you look at the Quarry Trail classrooms that we opened up, we, we had a minimal built-in cabinets and we had flex furniture with wheels on it. So not only are your desk and chairs on casters and wheels, the actual cabinets were too. And so as we design these portables or whichever way we go, we will have that same theme in the new classrooms going forward. So, so the five that we're building right now at Cory Trail will have the flexible furniture to match what's on the campus. So then, and I guess, and this just goes off, I think all the great math work that, that we've seen with the whiteboards and things, when, when we go to that setup, is there a way to incorporate either brackets or connectors or things that, so we can always do that 
just, just to avoid the easels, right? If we're touching it once, can we fix it? Well, what we've added is um, whiteboards in front and the back of the, camp, of the classroom. That, that's our new standard. And um, by eliminating a lot of the built-ins, it allows us to have more space in these classrooms. And the teachers are able to go in more group teaching. So this one on here looks like it's up against the building that it's next to. Is that standard? Or I know a lot of times portables are sort of off on their own and separate. Are, is it going to look more like this, where they're up against each other or up against buildings? So when we designed Cory Trail, the design was an intent to have a before and after school program portable right next to the front of the campus for the drop off for the younger kids when we designed that whole side of the campus. So we, we have to have a separation. There's a five foot separation in between the buildings. Now for the growth project that's going on right now, those portables are a bank of five portables that are their own wing. So they're not connected to a wing, but it's in line with building F. Now we have another wing right next to it and there'll be a walkway in between to match what's in, you know, the same design that we did with the other wings on the campus. So if we, like we, we go to an, an existing campus, there will be, there'll, these portables will be, or whatever way we decide to go, will be put right back in the same place that they're at. But there's a bank of eight portable buildings right now, say at Antelope Creek, we would put those right in the back in the same spot because of the cost of utilities. And once you start moving into another location, then it gets real expensive because you have to, your, your underground work is gonna really raise the price of the project. Um, going back just a minute to the sinks, and I know you had talked a, a little bit about new cabinet sink combinations. Um, is that, that's regardless of whether it's a portable or it's a stick frame built building, correct? Correct. When, when we program okay. any new classroom, we, we go with our district standards. So whatever delivery method we end up going with, they will have those same standards, okay. correct. And I guess, just to clarify, so a portable, would there be any limitations as to the ability to install restrooms, to have the, the sinks that any other building would have? Are there any limitations, the portable as opposed to the stick frame building, permanent building? Well, the, the standard is, um, if, if you have a TK portable building or classroom building, it's approximately 1,440 square feet. And that's including, that's why we, it's a little bit bigger than your typical general ed classroom at 960 square feet. That gives you enough room to have a workroom for the teachers and a bathroom in there for the, for the little ones. So your typical 960 square foot, if you put a bathroom in there, it would really make that a small teaching environment. Um, but we do put sinks in the lower grades for um, new classrooms. Well, and there is some flexibility, right, I think, to that question. The um, adult transition program portable that you showed me, that bathroom and kitchen was not original, correct? So that was added, so you can add even as much as a bathroom to an existing portable. Exactly. Okay. And so what we did before we did that project, we sat down with special ed and we did our programming and said, what are the instructional needs for your program here? And then we were able to add a kitchen, add a bathroom. We put this certain type of flooring in there to, to match what the needs of the program were. We're able to design it and build it that way. And then it can get quite hot <laughs> here in Rockland. Uh, is there any limitation on heating air as far as a portable versus a permanent building? Same airflow. The same airflow. And actually, the, the newer portable buildings and, and, and modulators that are coming out, and, and even the, you know, if you go with the, a permanent build, you have the rooftop units. They're, they're much more energy efficient, but they have to have the same airflow that goes into the building, whether whatever project delivery we go with. Any other questions on a portable classroom? No? Okay, so onto a modular. So it's, it's real similar to the portable building. So they're, they're built off-site at a manufacturing facility. They're also trucked in, and they're either dropped in by a truck or a crane. But the significant difference is that a modular building is placed on a concrete slab. And that triggers DSA timelines and more design for the architect in. And also, it pushes out the timeline for completion of the project. So that, that's your big difference between a modular and a portable building. Um, 
Modular buildings, they, they tend to have a, a larger lifespan, 30 to 50 years, and you can relocate a modular building. But if you look at the, the duration for the design to, to get through the manufacturing, because it's, it's more of a custom building, um, you have to have the architect involved working with the manufacturer to, to, to design something that fits on your site. Um, the Division of State Architect, DSA, it's also a longer timeline to get approval process through the state. Another uh, wonderful requirement that we have to do, is now it, it, when you go to a modular, there's other state requirements to get approval. Just before you can even get to DSA to look at your project, you have to do um, a soils report and you have to have a geological, geological survey done prior to even starting the design process and before you can get into the DSA. And that could be up to five months prior to even getting to the approval process. So it's real similar to um, a permanent build that I'll talk about here in a second. So here, here's a quick photo of uh, a modular building being, being placed. And as you can see, we have the, the concrete slab underneath. And that's the big difference between a portable building. Portable building, we cut a dirt pad, we compact it. We put the sleepers on there, we set the building. Here you, you have much more, um, not restriction, but you know, requirements to be able to set a modular building. So, you know, the, the last delivery- Can I just clarify on the modular? So we don't have any of those in Rockland Unified, right? Not that I know of, no. Okay. And, and, the, and the one at Rockland High School um, is very interesting because we're still trying to find Determine. out what happened back in the 90s. But you have, you have six portable buildings that were placed on a concrete footing. Okay, not a slab. Not okay. a slab, that's a concrete footing. So just for my colleagues' information, tomorrow Craig and I are going to Roseville Joint to look at a modular classroom, so I can kind of get a feel. Perfect. So a permanent built or traditional construction project is built on site, right? So it's either built on a concrete footing or a concrete slab. Nowadays, you, do, you really don't see um, a lot of school or commercial buildings or schools built on Footings, it's usually a slab like Cory Trail was built on. And, um, and it's, it, it's a slower process because you, can do one, you can't do one step without finishing another, right? You frame the wall, you set the beams, you sheetrock it, and you're doing it on site instead of having it done in a factory where it comes out completely done and then you just put you know, the pieces down on, on site. The buildings can't be relocated because they're permanent. Traditional buildings, 50 plus years. And you know, all three of these delivery methods is based on how we maintain them. So you could get longer life spans on, on any type of product that you put down as long as you're maintaining it and keeping up with the maintenance of the HVAC units and paint and inside and out. So a permanent building, there's a much longer timeline to get through the design process. Um, you know, and it's just it's just as like we did at Quarry Trail. So you're looking at 28 to 32 weeks prior to bidding just for the architect to design any type of permanent building. Um, the DSA timeline is longer than the other two project deliveries. And then as you go into the additional requirements, it's the same as the modular deliveries. Before you can even get to that process, you need to do your SOARS report and your other geological survey review. And then you can go in, that must be completed before you go into DSA. So you can, you can do a parallel path to start the design here, but you need to get this other section of work done before you can even submit to DSA to get the project approved. So it's a real lengthy timeline to get a, a permanent built approved and ready for construction. I threw a photo in here. Uh, you can just see how the design can get, you know, um, real pricey from a, a typical design to um, what they have here. Um, so this is the, the sheet that I really wanted to get into here with you guys as far as a cost comparison, where you can really see um, how these lay out as far as what you can get done with the you know, approximately $30 million of budget that we have. So if, you, if you, we talk about the portable classroom, we'll start up top, and you know, with the, the budget that we have, you can get 34 buildings you know, um, purchased with that. That includes the two TK portable buildings. And you can see that, that you know, we talked about the estimated life expectancy, and then the time to build or have a portable project completed is about three to four months. So we have 11 weeks um, in our summer. So 
So it's a real tight timeline. And the sooner that, in order to make a portable project successful, if we were going to do this on these projects, we would have to get approval a year prior so we can get into DSA, get it approved, and get into manufacturing so that the buildings are being brought out and stored on site prior to the summer break. So that when we demo the existing buildings, we, we you know get the pad because we're going to have to bring them down because a lot of these are have ramps, and then we're able to go immediately install the buildings and rush to get them completed. So um, if you go back to uh, when Jennifer was talking earlier when I assessed, we came up with 61 critical buildings that I that I walked. So if we you know we take the 34 from the 61, these are 27. So we're still we're still not meeting the need of the 61 building or classrooms that we need to replace by getting the 34 completed. Quick question, just sure. for those listening in that may not have sat through our eh, lengthy board study session. <laughs> of those 61, are those replacements or are those new portables or buildings that are needed due to growth on a campus? Those are re replacement. So as we go down to the next uh, line here, modular, slab on grade, we could get 26 portables out of this, and about $32 million, up to, and it, it's about four to six months once the buildings are brought out to site to get your, your slab completed and then bring the pieces out. So it's a little more complex when you bring a modular building out. It doesn't come out in it's, 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 it's defined sections, and it, and it pushes the, the timeline out. And what that means and the impact for a modular building is that we would have to put temporary classrooms on site because I, I can't get that done over the summertime. And so you would incur additional cost to set temporary classroom buildings, move everything out, put them in temporary, and then when the project is completed, we move everything back in. We remove the, the portable buildings that are on the blacktop, and then we would have to repair the blacktop where the portables were there for temporary housing. Okay. Can you explain, so what are, where are the temporary classrooms coming from and are they, do they have power to, like how does that, they have air conditioning, because it's still hot, right, when school starts, how, how does that all kind of logistically work? Great question. So we would have to bring temporary power and water over to, and sewer over to the temporary classrooms out on site, and it's usually you fly the power overhead, and you, you bring the you have to trench over to the buildings, um, and they would have uh, air condition. They have to have air condition, clock bell speakers, communication, and, and we would have the DSA inspector. He's also inspecting the new construction. He inspects the temporary housing as well, so that before the kids go in there for temporary housing, they'd, they're they're safe and to the you know state standards. So you just have a temporary classroom set up. They would be on ramps because it's, you know, we, we don't want to disrupt too much or take up too much of the blacktop and have much more repair on that area. So it's, it, as, as we're, if we were to go that route, as you're demoing the, the existing buildings, you're working a parallel path as getting the temporary buildings set up because it's, it's a lengthy timeline just to get all the infrastructure in place to set up the temporary housing. And then it's, it's we would, uh, we would be 35 short as a, of our 61 goal if we went with the, mobile, uh, the modular buildings. So for the permanent classroom buildings, you see we, we can only get about 15 permanent buildings. And eight to 10 months timeline, so that means that you would have temporary housing, longer length of time, um, more impact to your budget to have them there for the eight to 10 months. And then, um, you would be about 46 short of, a, of the goal of 61 that we were, you know, when I first did my assessment of the most critical need, portable buildings. Any questions on this? I know it's a lot of information. I go into a little more detail on the next sheet on cost. I do have a question. Yes. So our original portables that we have now, they're wood frame, is that right? Correct. So the new portables you said are aluminum frame? No, it, 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 it's, it's a moment steel frame. Exterior. Steel frame and then wood frame it in between. So it just gives it a more solid structure. But it has the same projected lifespan? Yes. Okay. 
I would love to know if we could get any closer on the modular estimated life than 20 year difference. 30 to 50 is such a big gap. Is that, you know, the best we can do on the projected life? That's what was recommended to me from mm -hmm. the architects that I talked to. Okay. And like I said earlier, it's, it's really based on how we maintain them. And it's like anything you own, the, the more you maintain and do preventative maintenance, you get longer life expectancy off, off of any product that you buy. Would you say the maintenance is different for either? Anything that we should be aware of? For example, you might get longer life out of a permanent building, but is less maintenance required? Are there tasks you might need to do with a portable every three years, five years that you may not need to do with a permanent building? I would say no. It's, it's, it's really the same. Yeah, I mean, we, we do our, our filter change. We check the preventive maintenance on the HVAC units. Um, you know, if there's uh, any plumbing that breaks, if it's under warranty, then we, we treat it the same way. Um, it's the same products that go in. Your, your infrastructure is the same. So your critical components that make a building or a, you know, portable or permanent operate, it's basically the same. Okay. Thank you. And please know it's a difficult task, right, to look at, you know, there's dollars and then there's longevity and we're having to weigh, so. which you. is more important than the other. So what we're trying to make sure, I'm trying to make sure I understand, are there any hidden costs that maybe we're not aware of in the moment? So thank you. So this slide, we, we, we break it down a little bit more on the cost per building. And you, and you can see the comparison between your portable, your modular, and your permanent built. And all the way over to the right, um, we break it down per square foot. Um, and what's, what's interesting is if you have a, like the portable a TK building with larger area, square footage actually drops down a little bit. And um, these, are, these are numbers that we, you know, I worked with some architects that have opened up jobs recently and some contractors that have bid jobs and have been awarded in the area. And these numbers are, are pretty current as far as what's going on in, in the market today and in our field today as far as uh, cost for projects. So we had, we had some groups that really helped us out to, you know, where are we now as we were compared to six months ago? Any questions on this, this sheet? So our, our next steps, based on your preference, you know, we would like to obtain quotes to begin the selection process for the Rockland Elementary TK portable projects. And the need here is the, the, the growth in TK. Um, you know, we're gonna need some housing for them not for next summer, 25, 26. Okay, but that's not part of the 61, correct? So, okay. the so, that, so that, that, that's really, we're looking for direction on that. And then we're gonna come back and present the facility master plan and capital project plan as an information item back on April 17th board meeting. And then come back in May and present the facility master plan and capital project plan for board action in uh, May 1st. So that concludes our lengthy presentation. If you have any questions or any more questions, I'd like to answer them. Who knew portables and permanent buildings were so difficult <laughs> of a decision to look at? But I appreciate you taking the time, and especially at the request of some trustees, to say we really want to understand this more. We really want to make sure we're making wise financial decisions that are meeting the needs of our students, uh, but also getting the longevity that we think we need. Um, and so I know it's not an easy task. Uh, Trustees, I, I know uh, this is an info item, um, so although there's not a vote tonight, um, I know that there has been some question about an immediate need of TK portables, um, looking in April and May then for the full master plan and the remaining um, ways that we want to address uh, the 61 um, over the course of the years. Are there thoughts on that? Any direction or concerns at the moment? This, the Rockland is included in the 61, right? We're not looking at separate. The, um, the TK portable project at Rockland Elementary is part of the 61, is that right? Oh, actually it is not because that's, that's new growth. It's the only uh, new growth for, that we project um, in, in TK and then our, our secondary schools are, are either stable or, or slight decline depending on the school. 
and then the area of growth is, is Quarry Trail, as you all you approved additional uh, stu housing uh, classrooms in the in the fall for that. So we really don't see we see TK as the growth area, and as we look out the next several years, it's the two at Rockland Elementary uh, th that we project. Other than that, it's really replacement of existing student housing. Yeah, so I think. Just, just looking back at, I think it's slide 18 for the two TK classrooms. Is it spending 2.5 million to get two portables? Is it spending 3.36, 3.4 million for two modulars or 5.2 for two permanent builds? That's what you're looking for, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Are there thoughts or concerns from any trustees at the moment to give some direction on those two? So are we are we voting on Rockland Out? We're just, I mean, given you know what I have seen at my girls' school at Quarry Trail and that Catalyst portable up front, you know if if the design elements are going to be adapted that way, you know to make sure that it fits you know the campus and is up to the the best you know materials that you're using everywhere i would want to move forward with that given um the need and the time constraints and just kind of what i saw on on our tour and over there now just for clarification this would just be going out for bids and still bringing it back to the board for approval is that correct we, we would like to go out and get an uh, architect uh, rfq we put an rfq out for the architect and we bring that back to the board for approval right so before staff does all the work on getting the request for proposals for architects and bringing that contract back for the services those would all be board votes but w the the direction we're seeking is is if the direction is to uh, to do port you know w which delivery method then that's the one we pursue versus we do that work come back and the board says well, we we would rather have this versus that. So we're seeking the direction on those because those are the are, that's the most immediate as as uh, Craig shared in his presentation. And then the other um, you know pieces we put out in the whole overall replacement project because we'll need direction on how to proceed for that and put that in the facilities master plan just as is the update. And then based on that, that's about a four to five year sequence of delivery of HVAC replacement, portable replacement, lighting. And so all, there will be like 50 to 100 votes and cents on like the architect, the contract. So there's a lot of uh, board decisions throughout any process. So the direction uh, that, that we're looking for is um, where to go in developing that, that, that plan so we can, you know, so, so as we have a clear direction from the board and how to proceed as we go forward. And of course, the board will have a lot of decision points along the way to, uh, on actual um, execution. And, and so the, the, there's the kind of the TK and then the, we have the replacement piece. And so we're just looking for that direction on how to prepare that to bring that back for board discussion and then deliberation and then, and then action. I'm assuming nothing's changed since our January meeting when it was communicated that those two classrooms are our most pressing need, right? Correct. Okay, so I'm fine with them getting bids since that's our fastest way to get these classrooms for those two. I'll say, I think given the challenges with state funding and given the challenges from a budget standpoint to try to keep it I think you get your best bang for your buck at 2.5 million and two portables over yeah I'd love to have permanent built but like double mm -hmm. that's tough given all the money's not falling out of the sky anymore, so. even harder for for me is the price of the portable I mean the to spend a million dollars for one 20 to 25 year classroom is inc it's like pulling teeth that's incredibly difficult to commit that and, and i would say that the most popular 
thing in student housing in California is TK portables because of the age requirement, the state changing that and really adding a whole grade. And, 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 and also, that's not just that, but we can have less people in those rooms because it's a two to 20 ratio. And so um, this is a, a, almost every district in California is trying to figure out how to add capacity unless they're declining enrollment. So that it being we're a market-based economy, um, that's also driving part of the need. And then all the inflationary pressures that we all feel on every time we go to the grocery store, um, you, we see in this as well. And, and so these are like, I've like I think any, we were talking in our, many of us having a lot of experience in education, um, nice way of saying we've been around a bit. Um, these are numbers that are just, again, mind boggling um, that, that we would look at. Because um, I can recall portable prices of, oh, half a million. And, and that would be high. Mm. Yeah, and I'll just chime in saying, you know, I think longevity is always really important to me. I think it's important that we look at not just what's a quick fix, but what's going to really serve our students and our district well long term. Um, however, you know, getting the answers, I got to some of my questions that were not seeing a uh, change in limitations on either one. We're, yeah, we're, we're able to still deliver the same experience to our students. We're not limiting our teachers in any way. Even the square footage is the same. Um, hearing all those assumptions and assuming all those assumptions are accurate, um, I think I'd be comfortable for these two uh, moving forward as well. Uh, Superintendent Stock, do you feel you've received direction that you need for the evening? I, I feel that if we were to bring that information back to the board, it would be received in alignment with the, the direction of the board. And, and then we will, um, you know, and then I'm thinking, just, just thinking with you here to prepare the next uh, items is we'll, we'll be bringing back, um, because we've done, as you saw, an extensive series of study sessions, board meetings of information to build the facilities master plan update which is, is really uh, an update on the current needs from our, our, our employees, our, 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 our staff there, professionals, architects, all that goes in to just identify needs, uh, whether they are, will, would be in the future um, you know, uh, funded or, or actually put into place, but we want to acknowledge their, the variety of, of needs as we look forward and as we've done. And that this is in no means setting any allocations or setting any priorities within that that we just have, um, however, the board has uh, been fiscally re responsible. To, we've accrued about $58 million in capital project funds that we can expend on, on things the board's given direction on, the HVAC, the lighting, um, looking at some solar pieces this summer that we're doing, and then portable replacement that we just have a sense of how to prepare that so the board can have a discussion and deliberation. Um, so that's where, in bringing this item, we were hoping to receive some indication of what the board would like us to put into that next uh, presentation regards to this portion of the capital projects. Like I said, the HVAC lighting, we, we've kind of checked, check, and, and so we're here. So um, is, there any, uh, is there any direction on which, which of these we should prepare in that next phase? That would be appreciated if, if we're there. Any thoughts on, you know, what I'm hearing is, thank you for the immediate direction, but yet there's also a need for direction if you're going to be out preparing the FMP, our facilities master plan, for those listening in, uh, you need to know how to prepare that facilities master plan. Um, and essentially, I'm hearing there's two phases for the replacement, right? There's the immediate dollars that we have uh, that we talked about. I think it ends up being 21 portables, maybe 24, depending on which ones you're looking at. Um, and then there's the overall facilities master plan that, you know, I'm sure would show the full 61 if we had the dollars to do that. Is that correct? Well, the, the overall, no, the facility master plan would, is showing the 34 on the portables. We didn't show all 61. Oh, you just identified 61 you would like. Okay, right, but the, right. okay. Base it off what would the funding available that was incorporated into the facility okay. master plan. Got you. But either way, it sounds like uh, looking, are we ready tonight? Is there anybody that has a concern over them uh, preparing the facilities master plan with portables versus permanent? I guess, I, I guess the only other question then is you'd have to keep some kind of theme per school. You couldn't do a, if you're going to put four portable or four spaces up, you couldn't do two permanent built and two portables next year. I mean, you could, but it would be very, very difficult. 
if you're going to do four buildings, you'd want to do, just as an example, you want to do four permanent or four portable or four modular given the spot in the school, right? You wouldn't want to mix and match at the same site, correct? It, it would be difficult and it, more expensive. Anyway, I, I, I know you can do it. I'm just saying it would be very, very difficult to do that today. So if we wanted to say, hey, let's put portables here and let's put permanent built here, you'd want to stay consistent to a site if we went down that path. Programming wise, it would be an easier delivery method, but we could chop it up any way you want. Okay. It, is, it is doable, but it would be more expensive. Okay. Yes. Yeah, every time you, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, given the you know reality of the budget that we're operating in, and just you know what I've seen and the the questions that you've answered from us tonight, I feel comfortable moving forward. Um, I mean, we're still we're still at 34. We're not at 61. And from what I understand, that this pot that we're kind of pulling this from, that is not going to. It's not like next year we're going to get another batch, right? So if we don't utilize it to impact, you know, the most classrooms right now, then we don't really have a we don't have a plan for when we'll be able to do more. So. You know, Currently, it, we have no other identified sources for revenue for these purposes other than that $58 million, and that really is projecting us out over the next six to eight years, and then we know it's going to start stepping down because we're built out in this area. I don't mean to put a monkey wrench in the evening, but... I was expecting an information item, and I'm I am prepared to say um, give direction to go forward for the immediate need, but to say to go forward with portables for the whole FMP feels like a vote. It doesn't feel like accepting an information item. I'm not yeah. comfortable. It, it, and then I, I, you know, m the in, the intent was to um, do the conversation to potentially receive some direction. If the board's not ready to give that, then by no means would, would I um, want the board to feel they needed to give direction when they're not ready. The 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 uh, the hope was by by providing the information from the requested from the January 30th that we may be in a place to provide that and if the board's not then 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 truly uh, this is a large expenditure and 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 then 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 we're not ready there and so what would um, so just to assist me in meeting the needs of the board um, what would be uh, the next step would it be to bring this back in the April 17th meeting as a is a uh, is a discussion item further on portable or placement delivery? Would it be as an action item to give direction on that? What would, um, what would, what would the board like to see as the next step with that? I think our normal protocol is one meeting is information, the next meeting is action. Okay, so then um, just just to make sure I'm clear, is then we would bring back on April 17th as an action item portable delivery methods for the capital facilities project, so that we would have a vote to have direction then. Subsequent from that direction, we could then work that into the FMP and bring that back as information then as vote. Would that meet the needs of the board? What was the date on the FMP? We would just move, like we would go April 17th, May 1st, May 15th, if that, that works for the sure. board. Okay, I know, and again, this was really meant to, um, if there was a board was in a space to give direction, wonderful, if not, then, then to uh, make sure that we were clear on the next steps to take to, to, to help the board uh, have the information they need. And so I did hear on the TKs at, uh, two at Rockland L to go ahead and work with a portable delivery method and bring back that information to the board and then to schedule another um, uh, information. If the board would like any additional information on the portable or placement for the April 17th, please let me know so we can include that. Otherwise, we would essentially bring you the same information we have. So if you generate other questions or wonderings and you would like information, just let me know and we'll make sure we include it uh, in, in the presentation uh, for April 17th. Thank you, Superintendent Stock, and thank you both for your presentation this evening. Okay, we'll now move on to item 12.1, public comment. 
on non-agenda items. A few important reminders to read off. This agenda item is to give anyone in attendance an opportunity to address the board in an open meeting concerning any non-agenda items within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. The board will not take action on any item not appearing on the posted agenda, but may refer the matter to a staff member for follow-up. A complaint about a specific employee of the district shall be made to that employee's immediate supervisor or the principal as required by Administrative Regulation 1312.1. To protect student privacy, please refrain from using student names or identifying characteristics. The board respects each individual's rights to express varied ideas and opinions and expects speakers to refrain from personal attacks based on protected categories under state and federal law, including race, religion, sexual orientation, disability, etc. Please be mindful that students may be watching. Please fill out a green public comment card, complete with all information, and turn in prior to the agenda item being closed. I will call your name to invite you to the podium and will state who is on deck. When you approach the podium, please restate your name, the city you live in, and the school your children attend. You will have two minutes to address the board. All comments must be respectful. Please, no profanity. Seeing we do have public comment cards, we will start with Alicia Watkins, and on deck will be Kara Anzalone. My name is Alicia Watkins. I reside in Auburn. Uh, faith, speech, press, assemble, redress. That is the core values of the First Amendment of the Constitution of these United States. And I think that we can all find common ground in how important that First Amendment is. It was very heartbreaking when I saw a law-abiding stakeholder who pays taxes, who's a parent in this community, have her comment cut in half um, when she was trying to redress grievances to her local government. And when you're sitting on that diocese, you are the local government for the school board, for the school district. Um, I understand faith is very important. I'm an atheist, but I respect everybody's right to have their faith and express their faith. And I know President Sadoff is very involved in your church, and I respect that. We may disagree on a lot of things, but I respect your right, and I understand why there might have been some defensiveness, and I honor that, okay? But someone was very concerned because boundaries have been crossed by certain members of the board in the past regarding calls for certain people to come onto committees. Um, just certain things have been crossed, and... Um, I think it's a very slippery slope when we start deciding who can say what during their public comment. I respect the vulgarity part. I respect um, something that may be outlandish, but I've been to board meetings throughout this whole county, and I've literally seen atrocious behavior allowed. So it broke my heart to see somebody who was just a concerned parent trying to voice their concern regarding a situation here. I understand why, but it was heartbreaking. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Alicia. Next up, Kara, and on deck, we have Faith Lyles. Saloni, I'm a, I live in Auburn, I'm a Rockland business owner. I am requesting that if you will not rescind your forced outing policy, that you take your non-discrimination policy off your district website and stop displaying the Title IX law there because you will soon be found in violation of this law as you fail to keep children safe with your district policy to out transgender and non-binary kids. What you post on your website is misleading and quite contradictory to what is actually happening in this district. You don't get to pick and choose which provisions you are going to adopt under this title, so in fact you should state on your district website that no student, teacher, or administrator is protected under Title IX in your district because your district is choosing not to abide by that federal law. Nobody is safe, not a teacher, administrator, or student is safe in any of your schools at this time. I will be contacting your Title IX coordinators and also be filing a discrimination complaint with the United States Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights. I am hoping that your disregard for Title IX law and your subsequent creation of a hostile educational environment that you will ultimately be found guilty of will force your board members who are guilty of negligence to disclose your crime on future professional applications or background checks for security clearance, et cetera. You are putting your schools at risk. 
as educational facilities can be found liable in court and you are putting the families of trans and non-binary non children at risk by misrepresenting your organization and allowing them to be intimidated and bullied at school and at home. I'm in the process of notifying Rockland community members and other local business owners about who sitting on this board voted in favor of this dangerous, dangerous and negligent policy. I would imagine that none of you have a transgender or non-binary child at home, which is a very good thing. That's why there are laws like Title IX, to protect kids from you. Please do your job. Please protect the children. Thank you, Kara. Next up, Faith Lyles on deck, Ryan Tucker. Good evening. I just wanted to come up here and continue to advocate for my students and who I consider my own children. Oh, by the way, Faith Lyles. Uh, I work at uh, Catalyst Kids at Sierra Elementary School and I live in Smartsville, California. Uh, I think it is crucial to recognize the privilege that does come for advocating for policies that could potentially harm marginalized students, particularly our transgender children. While you may not fully grasp the extent of, extent of the privilege you hold, it's evident the allocation of resources towards legal battles and policies targeting transgender youth reflects a failure to prioritize the well-being and inclusivity of all students. I highly recommend redirecting efforts towards creating a safe and supportive environment for every student. Every student. Rather than enf enforcing unnecessary and discriminatory policies, they, students should be the primary focus. This shift, is, this shift in focus is essential for promoting equality and addressing the real needs of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Faith. And now up, Ryan Tucker. Hello again. I'm sure you're more than aware as to why I repeatedly show up to these, whether I speak up or not. How much money have you spent on continuously trying to out trans kids, from the original policy to the court case to its current pending on how that's going to end? Which I think we all know how that's going to pass, as you're violating California's education law, as well as the Constitution itself. What are you actually trying to get out of this, education-wise? Or is this another one of those policies in which the school wants complete control over a specific group? Those of which that are entitled to have privacy about who they are. Because let me tell you, kids not identifying with what they assigned with at birth is not something to spend so much money on. Compared to the lack of funds in our schools, lack of desk upgrades, building damages, overall funds for school activities, et cetera. For example, my sign language class is unable to get proper desks for the curriculum due to the district's lack of funding. It was also stated in the past that a lot of money was spent on that power outage in January. It was definitely in the hundred thousands or maybe more, but why do you care so bad about the trans kids? Also, as Mr. Mojette mentioned earlier tonight, you are incredibly heartless to those that mention this policy. You ignore them by either sitting on your phones or, or, or openly stating for them to be quiet and discuss something related to the topic when it was on topic. You just dislike to be called out, which is most likely why you are no. <clears throat> continue to ignore these voices and you will eventually just face the consequences from the law itself. It is absolutely disgusting how all of you speak to those people of the district. Thank you, Ryan. We will now move to item 13.1, uh, pending agenda items. Trustees, do you have any pending agenda items you would like to add? Seeing none, we will now move to closed session. Thank you. <laughs> 